Welcome to the podcast that brings you high voltage, intriguing information, as well as electrifying conversation on all topics, current, past, and yet to be. This is Phase to Phase. The first step in avoiding the trap is knowing of its existence. I've been having these weird thoughts lately. Without change, something sleeps inside us and seldom awakens. Here are your hosts, Marcus and Drew. Hello, welcome everybody. Hi again. Hey, Marcus. Happy Thanksgiving. Sorry. Hello? You caught me off guard, and then I was trying to come back, and I didn't know when to come back. Is this thing on? Hello? Hello? Uh, What are we going to talk about today, Marcus? Today, we're talking about the Black Panthers. Awesome. So it's going to be kind of like a bio episode, but... A bio of many people. A bio of many. Mm -hmm. I like that. E pluribus unum bio. (laughs) Out of many bios, one bio. Okay, right, right, right. Exactly. right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, we're going to talk about some of the key players of the civil rights movement, some of the more kind of like darker, uh, you know, and far more interesting like moments of the civil rights movement involving the Black Panthers, all the things that happened therein, starring uh, such people like uh, Fred Hampton and uh, Huey P. Newton, all the, uh, all, all, well, not all the all stars, but like, you know, a good, a good smattering of the good ones. How are we going to dive right into this, Marcus? I originally was thinking we should do another biography episode on just Fred Hampton. But eventually I was like, it kind of evolved. Yeah. Because, you know, you can't really explain. It's, it's just it's a, like the backup thing. thing. We have to yeah. zoom out. Hold on, let me zoom out again. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You can't explain Fred Hampton without explaining who the Black Panthers are. Right. And then, or like, the, you or, might or as well what was going on at the time. Yeah, exactly. And, yeah. Yeah. The yeah. culture. And mm-hmm. the, yep. Basically what I'm going to do is everything kind of from the lens of the Panthers. Well, that would be, another that would be perfect because where your insight is probably a little more in depth. You can kind of just how we normally do only. Mm-hmm roles reversed or whatever where you're going to kind of tell me right more that and i can just kind of react to most of it yeah, because for sure. I, like i said like i, I only knew like a, 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 like a the, the, the surface barely of 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 uh, fred hampton or whatever i'm like yeah. holy god this dude is freaking um what's the saying vast and contains multitudes right <laughs> <laughs> so remember when you first told me that you had you're interested in doing this guy mm-hmm. and i was like oh yeah i remember him like right. And so when you were like, okay, yeah, let's for sure do one on him. I yeah. was like, okay, well, let me go back and kind of see re- see what I remember about him or whatever. Mm-hmm. Cause I remember hearing about him a bunch like a long time ago and like, God damn, dude, I, that was when I first heard about him was before I really started getting in depth, uh, to like history and mm-hmm. the narrative oh, okay, and right. the news yeah. and just, uh, you know, anything that's relatable, even kind of or whatever. And so it, I kind of went right by my radar, dude. I was like, oh, cool. It was just like, uh, you know, really like uh, articulate, freaking, you know, um, charismatic dude who was a uh, leader of the Black Panther Party, and da 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 da. And he died from, uh, you know, like uh, some kind of inca- I, I don't remember exactly what it was, but something about police. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like mm. big surprise. And um, <laughs> and uh, and that was just it. He was just another dude, like lost like, in yeah, lost like in the civil rights Huey movement Newton somewhere. Or fucking, yeah, yeah, exactly. Or any of these dudes, or uh, uh, Bobby Seale, or whatever. Um, I just didn't really remember anything. And then when you told me like, yeah, for sure, I wanted to do it, and I started kind of re remember you know doing little bits of research or whatever you'd be like oh let me find out what it was like, oh yeah that's right oh yeah that's what I, and then i got like really into it like oh my Dang. god dude <laughs> how did i know, how did this guy's like whole thing kind of just breeze right by me because yeah. um it's it's fucking fascinating we'll talk about it we'll, we'll get into it like tesla i feel like these stories kind of got buried in history class and even after i learned more about the panthers i never even really heard about fred hampton totally i heard briefly about the black panthers in school when they kind of just glossed over like American the history, civil rights movement, yeah, yeah exactly it was just, right. Yeah, it was lumped ah, there was in. some stuff in like the sixties, late or late sixties, early seventies. I don't know, some stuff happened. I don't know. All right, there were some mad black men, and yeah, they were all women, uppity, and, and they put their fists and, in the air, yeah, and totally. something about guns, and now everything's fine. Yeah, right. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It, it seems like when the civil rights movement gets taught in schools, they only teach about like the nonviolent protests. Like they kind of gloss over, and everything I feel like else. they're afraid to kind of like face those parts of. That's history because they're more nuanced and and it's hard to have those discussions for sure in school for sure yeah and like you said it made it sound like racism was defeated by like the civil rights act right and that's funny to me when people say things like that because it's like it's like well yeah we got rid of like legally and policy like yeah yeah we got rid of like systemic racism that's a good first step like good I think it was like Stokely Carmichael who was basically first brought up that point of a, of a, of a systemic racism basically the thing about the Panthers is it's kind of hard to find good sources. 
uh, throughout my research, and we'll we'll discuss a little bit further on why that like might be. Like objective sources, right? That too. Yeah. Yeah. It was and a very tumultuous time. There was a lot of like contradicting information even in the sources that I found. So like kind of the same thing with Tesla, dates might be wrong or the right. numbers might be a little fudged. Right. And, you know, I, I'm not a historian, but I try to do my due diligence here. Indeed. Here at Face to Face, we try to strive to bring you the deepest and most <laughs> objective information. I like primary sources. So, Dude, I like primary sources too. We should hang out. Oh, we should like make a podcast <laughs> oh or something. God, totally. <laughs> I'm getting such a major clue right now. Um, <laughs> oh my God. Are you get a clue? I'm here. getting a clue too. I'm going to be quoting a lot from uh, the book Seize the Time, written by uh, Bobby Seal. Nice. It's, te- it's tempting to quote the whole damn book. And I really like the way that it's written because it's, it's literally just transcribed from tapes. So it's the way he talks, just put directly verbatim into text awesome so it's pretty interesting the recurring theme with tesla's life was you know like he was kind of book smart not like people smart here i feel like there was a theme that kind of jumped out to me opportunity out of tragedy basically Mm -hmm. like turning finding a way to make sure the japanese have like a word for that literally i'm pretty sure like uh, maybe it's chinese but like (laughs) the same word for like danger or tragedy or whatever is opportunity basically something something like that where just basically means like it's it's a a little poetic yeah exactly where it's like they're they're the same thing it's just if you're negative about it then it's that's how it's going to be but if you're positive about it it's like an opportunity you know my last disclaimer here before we get into it is i'm going to be going mostly chronologically but there will be times where i'll have to just kind of jump around a little i will have to jump around a little to get the point across and to not confuse because it's really deep so we're going to stay on topic connections Yeah, yeah yeah for sure okay and uh there's a lot there's so many rabbit holes with this topic, and sometimes I'm just going to have to leave a rabbit hole, rabbit hole, and if you want to chase it, I'll I'll throw you. Yeah, throw leave, something. Leave into a it. link and let. It, yeah, exactly. <laughs> okay, here we go. So, it's important to understand the background of all these events because what is any of this stuff without the context, context that yeah. it was taking place in? Yes, sir. Obviously, most people know that there was a big struggle in civil rights going on in the '60s. Most people are familiar with like the like the stuff that was going on like at Birmingham with like the dogs and the yeah. the water hoses. Fire hoses. Yeah. yeah. Not exactly the uh, brightest point in uh, America's not quite civil history. Uh, and of course, there was like political failures with like uh, the Freedom Summer in Mississippi, the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party, and Fannie Lou Hamer, and all that stuff in '64. The Watts riots in '65. That's the first rabbit hole I'm not going to touch, but that happened in '65. Mm-hmm. Death of Malcolm X is also in '65. Yeah. And this particular event had a strong impact on one Huey Percy Newton. Which Huey is the- P. Newton. Yes, the first Black Panther we're going to talk about. So he was born in 1942 in Louisiana. His family moved to Oakland when he was young, and he Oakland's was... Oakland's going to be like the uh, center, like the, the mecca... At the center, The yes. mecca of freaking civil rights movement mm. in, uh, in the United States in the late 60s, early 70s. Right. So he was actually illiterate until the 11th grade. Uh, his teacher was saying that he was too dumb for college. So he taught himself to read and eventually got into college. In all full disclosure... He uh, committed some petty crimes to put himself kind of through through college to get through. As yes, rep- you do. Yeah. He represented himself in court, actually, to beat some misdemeanors that he that he attained. Ah, usually that's not uh, recommended. Not usually, no. But Did he a- pull a uh, My Cousin Vinny and totally, totally like, uh, argue out of it and use logic and persuasiveness? I mean, basically, to- he's he was just – people underestimated how articulate he was and how smart he was. That happens a lot. It's kind of a theme going on through Yes, here. sir. He studied at Merritt College, Oakland City College, and the University of San Francisco School of Law. And in 1962, at Merritt College, he met Bobby Seale. Ah, another key player. Yeah. So just like the Tesla episode, I'm going to kind of intersperse some fun facts in here. I don't even know if I should call this a fun fact because in the Huey P. Newton story, which was like a play that like Spike Lee made into a movie. Yeah, produced. That movie claims that Huey is mixed and that his grandfather was white and raped his grandmother, but I Damn. couldn't find any information substantiated. If that's that. actually true or whatever. Yeah. Spike Lee, you know, sometimes takes liberties with certain he does. things or whatever, especially with... um. Uh, you know, white dialogue in his movies. You know, I don't know if you're familiar with the famous like Family Guy joke where he's like, "Oh, this is about as authentic as freaking uh, white dialogue in Spike Lee movies." <laughs> and the guy walks in, and is like, "Hey, can I get a piece of pizza?" And the freaking the guy behind the counter is a white guy. He's just like, raw, 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 like foaming at the mouth. You're like, oh, "Okay, I think I get the point here." So yeah, Bobby Seal. Bobby was born Robert George Seal in Texas in 1936. Texas. He had an abusive father, which I think haven't we all right? But I. <laughs> 
I think that played into his whole idea of like questioning authority and standing up against a bully kind of a thing. Well, that would do that. It would make you kind of question the whole narrative or whatever when you kind of come to the realization. Because every, every, every kid has that eventual realization. That their like, parents oh, aren't heroes. Yes, dude. Yeah, and that the adults and, you know, grownups around them are just as, you know, incompetent and ignorant and dumb as basically they are. You know right. what I mean? Yeah. So he joined the Air Force in 55. Awesome. He was dishonorably discharged in 59 after he got into a spat with uh, his superior. Oh, that's all? Like, he got in, like, a little fight and they they, they, they booted him? Yeah. There he didn't was... get busted for anything else? Like, drugs or anything? Like, no, they still kicked like, him out? No. It was just, you know, it's the military. You can't really be doing that, number yeah, one. And, like, true. It was, he got into, like, a physical altercation with somebody and then, like, it got to a superior. It's a little muddy. I didn't quite understand the way it was presented in the book. But, okay. Interesting. So I just kind of shortened it to argument with the superior. Oh, weird. So his discharge made it hard for him to find work. You'd get hired, and then they would find out. And the, he was dis- like, well, the dishonorable discharge yeah. part kind of probably left a little bit of a mark of uh, yeah, right. agreed. Oh, yeah, sure. And eventually he became a steel worker and went to uh, Merritt Junior College, like I mentioned, in Oakland at night. Okay, so he went to Oakland also. Mm-hmm. Okay. Kind and of a recurring theme here. Fun fact, he did some stand-up on the side. Oh, no way. Yeah. Huey P. Newton in the news. <laughs> oh, wait, no, that's something else. Sorry, sorry, yeah. sorry. Go ahead. Move on, move on. During the whole Cuban blockade, you know, with the whole missile crisis and the that ships old, moving in. That old chestnut. That old chestnut. Uh, Bobby saw Huey speaking to a crowd at the college. I'm going to quote from Seize the Time. He had a couple of quotes about Huey. Huey was a large influence on the whole campus. I got to know where Huey was on campus. He, I wasn't a running partner of Huey's then, but I was catching him on the streets. We would all wig out behind Brother Huey, and I guess everyone respected Huey's mind and also Huey's guts. He had something about him that he didn't drive over people, but he would never let anyone drive over him especially in a violent and rowdy fashion because I didn't know it at the time, but I learned later. Huey had kind of a hidden reputation on the block with the brothers. There were cats all over East and West Oakland who had reputations for being bad, and they were known throughout the community for being bad. Huey didn't have this kind of reputation. The bad cats terrorized the community, and Huey terrorized the bad cats. Hmm. You heard a lot of stories about Huey. Like one night at a party, Huey accidentally stepped on some brother's shoes, and Huey stepped back and said, Excuse me, brother. The brother, he was bad, one of those bad dudes. He said, Motherfucker, excuse me, don't reshine my shoes. I <laughs> stepped on his J's. Mm-hmm. Huey knew his brothers very well. When the dude slid back to the side and dropped his arm slightly to the right, hanging behind his right thigh, Huey saw this. He knew this was the time to fire. Next thing you knew, Huey fired on him and decked him, and the other bad dudes at the party, who were this deck dude's friends or partners, wanted to know who this cat thinks he is. And just in case I wasn't clear, he punched him. He didn't shoot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> at first, I'm like, God damn, he shot me. He doesn't fuck around. Oh, oh, okay. Huey don't okay, fuck okay, around. Okay, okay. okay. Uh, <laughs> and so they jumped up and said that Huey needs his ass kicked. And Huey told them, I'll fight all of you one at a time, or I'll fight all of you at the same time. And you won't wait outside for me. I'll be waiting outside for you. Awesome. <laughs> no, no, not fuck me, bro. Yeah. Fuck you. And then he walked outside and waited and dared them to come outside. Here's another quote. There's another thing about Huey. I remember one time there were some black nationalists, cultural nationalists on the campus who used to project all this cultural nationalism. They were so engrossed in this cultural nationalism that they just hated white people simply for the color of their skin. This is where Huey and I got this thing about cultural nationalists. Huey had opened the door for a sister to go through. You know how a man opens the door for a woman? There happened to be a white girl coming right behind the sister, and so the white girl walked in. So one of the cultural nationalists ran up to him and said, How come you opened the door for that white girl? And Huey turned around and looked at him. He said, look, man, I'm a human being and I'm not a fool. I opened the door for the sister. There happened to be a white girl behind her. The white girl's not attacking me. She's not brutalizing me. So there's nothing wrong with keeping the door open for her to pass through, too. Fact. Yeah. And the cultural nationalists just went out of their minds, exaggerating the shit. That's just one point to show Huey's humanism toward all other human beings. This wow. is the way he is. That's uh, that's going to be a continuing point mm-hmm. in uh, today's movement of just like the indignance of just blanket statements. Well, that and just broad like, brush if, painting. That and if somebody freaking like uh, does something like nice for somebody, all of a sudden it means something else. Oh yeah, it means like a deeper meaning. It's like no motherfucker, I was just holding the door for this chick. Just dude. being a human being. Just trying to be nice to her, yeah. dude. Like she was there, I was there. What? Why do we have to turn everything into this fucking big political like yeah. meaning or whatever, dude? She was there. She wanted to get inside. I held the door. I was there. Fucking no big deal, dude. Why yeah. are you making such a big deal out of this? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And but there was there was some of that going on. Uh, one last quote from the book: "This is the way I saw him, and this is the way I've always thought of the cat. He's the kind of cat you always respect. He's a kind-hearted person. You can't use his kindness, but he'll give it away. So you look at him and say, what kind of cat is this? This brother here is something else. Like leading by example, totally. Yeah, I like that." Yeah. Making people go like, oh, there's a different way. That's cool. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh-huh. And li- like I said, this is how Bobby talks. So um, I love 70s like dialogue, by the way. Right. Let's talk about like cats and brothers and shit. Dude. Right. I love it. 
I was listening to a podcast um, while I was researching this, and this guy was talking about how his dad still talks like that because his dad was a panther. He's totally. Like, Put it on a plate and split it, Jack. Yeah. He's like, Dad, what <laughs> the hell are you trying to say? I love that. Dude. That's <laughs> awesome, bro. In the book, Bobby calls Huey a righteous brother. He says, I needed to find a righteous brother that I can run with. Awesome. And I say brother to brother. everybody now, dude. Yeah. Like, I mean, and I have for like forever, dude. And every now and then, I'll like, because I, I literally say it to everybody. It's like yeah. every now and then when I just kind of say it and like automatically and mm-hmm. I say it to like a, a black guy. Yeah. Uh, so I, in the back of my head, I'm like, oh, I hope he doesn't think I'm just saying that because he's black. Because <laughs> some people do do that. They yeah, like no, change so, the way hey, they brother, talk to fucking, people. He's five on the flip side and yeah. jab and he's like, fuck you, bro. Yeah. Like just talking like a goddamn human right. being, bro. <laughs> exactly. It's like when you talk to foreign people, like for some reason you just, you just talk really loud. Open yeah, the loud door. and slow, and you slap an O on the end of it if they're Latino. Like, <laughs> open O the door, O please O for me, O. Yeah. You're like, bro, you sound like a goddamn, yeah. like a moron. Like he's not slow. He's yes. Fucking, yeah. <laughs> louder. Yeah. Why is that? Why do people get louder? And it's, it, 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 I think it's just instinctual. Yeah. It's just like animals trying desperately without even thinking, <laughs> like to like to try to communicate and get your point across. So maybe being louder is, is better. <laughs> it's like with kids, you, you're trying to like convey something to kids or whatever, and then they end up not getting it or whatever, mm-hmm. and they just keep doing it. You just start like yelling. You're just like, mm-hmm. I said, don't fucking touch it. And, it's like, <laughs> and then you're like, wait a minute, why, why did I say that? Like, why did I yell at him? It's like, because they're fucking freaking out and they're not getting it, dude. Like, yeah. Yeah. Some of these fun facts aren't really that fun, but hey, whatever. <laughs> they are facts. While the image of <laughs> while the image of armed black men in leather and berets is what most people think of when the pan- in regards to the Panthers, the majority of the Black Panthers were women. Don't forget about the fist raising. Yes. Uh, I'm not smiling during photos. Sorry, that's the other thing. <laughs> that's part of the uniform. Exactly. You know how some people push uniform as part of your smile? Exactly. What oh, the fuck? Word. A smile yeah, is yeah, part yeah, of your uniform. Exactly. Yeah. 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 You don't have enough flair. <laughs> Uh, I heard a figure that I couldn't confirm, but it was uh, t- uh, two thirds of the membership in 1970 were women. Uh, so uh, don't surprise me, actually. Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised. Women were a huge fucking portion of the. Yeah, uh, of we the- we we have to acknowledge the contributions that the women made. They were pretty much the fucking backbone of the Panthers, as they are the backbone of basically any exactly thing. exactly. <laughs> uh, besides being morally right, it was smart since you figure when the men get arrested, you know the women would have to fulfill the same roles. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they still have to take care of shit. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? In fact, uh, a woman named Elaine Brown actually ran the Panthers for a time. Cool. Uh, even though they were supposed to be equal, some women still face discrimination. You know, this kind of was the era. Yeah, it's still very machismo dominated. You know what I mean? Yeah. So I'm just going to list a few important female Panthers. Cool. Just to name drop. Lay down, me daddy uh, Elaine Brown, Kathleen Cleaver, Angela Davis, Asada Shakur. Angela Davis and Asada Shakur, yeah. obviously. Yeah. Erica Huggins, and even Shaka Khan. Oh, yeah. Shaka yeah. Khan, Shaka Khan. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so I'm going to put a link in. And of course, Queen Latifah. <laughs> yeah. I'm just kidding. I'm going to put a link in about uh, a good video highlighting some of this stuff. So both Bobby and Huey joined different activist groups at the campus, but after the Watts riots, they started their own group along with some others called the Soul Students Advisory Council, the mm-hmm. SSAC. Now this is all before the Panthers, right? Yes. This is the lead up to the creation. Mm-hmm. They're of still the in college. Party. They're awesome. still a twink. The Panthers are but a twinkle in Huey's eye. <laughs> so they organized protests against the draft. For um, sure. This is obviously a huge uh, wedge issue. Mm-hmm. According to Bobby, there was a time that Huey convinced his sociology class to demand a course on black history. Bobby attended that class and brought in Huey, who proceeded to outteach the professor. Awesome. <laughs> there were two formative incidents that led to the founding of the Panthers. There was one where the men were arrested after an incident where, like, Bobby was reciting poetry. Oh, and, like, man, what and, a crime. Right, yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, it was a bad poetry because, you know, like, no, I, was just I mean, it was sort of racially charged, but it wasn't like, you was know, it offbeat, it like, though, and did, did it not rhyme? Because, I mean, oh, that, yeah, that's it was what slam matters, poetry. Yes. Okay, so yeah. see, that's what matters. <laughs> Talk about content. Yeah. Um, so a fight broke out and then backup was called and then they ended up getting arrested. The other incident was when they observed a man being needlessly hassled and arrested and they used SSAC treasury funds to bail him out. Oh, nice. SSAC? The uh, Soul Students Advisory Council. Oh, the, right, right, right. Sorry, yeah. sorry. Yes, yes. It's you, just a long name. You so know I how I am it. with acronyms, dude. Come on. <laughs> so uh, Huey suggested that the SSAC arm themselves. Malcolm X once made a call for armed self-defense. Yes, because uh, certain police officers were not responding to certain calls that were being made in certain neighborhoods. That happened. And so, uh, yeah, if, uh, Malcolm X is basically like, why are we relying on the police? This is our neighborhood. Like, right. And in theory, people should be able to take care of their own. I, have, I completely respect and uh, agree with that whole mentality, 100%. Yeah. Yeah. I don't care what group you come from or what, uh, you know, yeah. what class you come from. So Huey thought this would also bring in, quote, the brothers on the block. Other SSAC members didn't agree with it. So in October 66, along with little Bobby Hutton, that was his totally. nickname, uh, Edward Big Man Howard, 
Reggie and Sherman Forte, they formed the Black Panther Party for Self-Defense. Act 1. With all that out of the way, let's get the story rolling. Yeah. Another quote from Seize the Time. So we left and said, later for the punks. Jive motherfuckers at the college. We just went to the streets where we should have been in the first place. The, those four or five years that preceded, this showed us that. And Huey, the brother off the block, had never really left the streets at all. And go to the streets they did. They distributed copies of the their 10-point program, which is kind of their whole fun. It's like a manifesto. Yeah, kind yeah of, I figured. Yeah, right. exactly. And talk to the community to recruit members and learn about the issues they were facing. They would address these later, but at this point, their primary focus was communal self-defense. Huey was inspired by the community alert patrol in the Watts na- that swarmed in the Watts neighborhood to observe police in black neighborhoods and give defenders legal advice and sometimes free representation. Caps. Cap, yeah. Huey argued that the Second Amendment gives individuals the right to bear arms, and that right would be stripped away after they started. Well, it doesn't just argue. I mean, it does. No, so that, he's he, right. No, I know, but it's just funny <laughs> to say, like, he argues. You're like, well, that was his argue. argument. Yeah, no, no, totally. Yes. I'm just making a point. <laughs> uh, and it, actually, he kind of turned out to be right with this. He also knew that California law at the time allowed him to carry a loaded weapon in public as long as it was not concealed. Right. In February of 67. Open carry, I believe is the term. Yeah. In February 67, they were on an armed patrol and an argument started. Huey and an officer argued over the observation and the legality of their weapons. A crowd gathered. Which is hilarious, by the way. It's not a job. It's not a cop's job to freaking argue the law with somebody. Yeah. Right. You, you, your job is to either arrest them or not, dude. Yeah. And you have to stand by that like choice you make because you might be wrong if you try to arrest this person if they haven't broken a law. You know what I mean? Right. But at the time, they didn't expect these poor black people to really know the law. So. No, of course. And I was going to bring that up or whatever. Uh, your point right there kind of feeds into the point I was going to make kind of later about how um, – there it is. Okay. Um, no one the law. Yeah. No when the law. No, no when, when the, the law. <laughs> <laughs> like a conservative, like like a Christian conservative version of that song. That's just like following the law, following the law. <laughs> well, that's funny. No beer in the left hand on Tuesday. Yeah. <laughs> Which, by the way, everybody breaks the law like all that's, the time. That's my point. That's why. Th- that's what's yeah. hilarious, dude. That's why I'm a hardcore libertarian. Because, like, bro. Fuck your laws, dude. <laughs> like, for real. Like, are you going to enforce all these things, dude? What, you're going to go fucking house to house and make sure 10 people aren't fucking in their house eating eating Thanksgiving? Fuck you, dude. Like, who the fuck do you think you are? So that's one thing that kind of uh, kind of brought to my attention or whatever, which kind of reminds me of that, like, Dave Chappelle joke about old timers from the ghetto are like, those motherfuckers are like qualified paralegals and shit. Um, <laughs> anytime my brother comes to do some dirt or whatever, somebody will pop up out of the fucking side and be like, oh, don't do that. Nigga, don't do that. Ten. That's five to ten. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, it's, it's funny or whatever, but like, it's true because they had to be savvy about the law in order to survive. Dude. Right. You know what I mean? Like, again, like, it's a joke, but it's, it's 100% true. For sure. A lot of truth and jest. Yeah. Uh, another quote from Seize the Time about this incident. And Huey out there, man. He's calling the pigs swine, dogs, sharecroppers, bastards, motherfuckers with his M1 in his hand and daring them. Just daring them. Yeah, and this is a whole long ordeal. I'm not going to go into the whole thing. Evidently, like, super post- interesting though, right? So It is. It's an interesting exchange because this is like the first time that had like a real confrontation. The spark. Bobby, like, he, he recounts the whole story. And I'm going to post a link to seize the time. You can actually find it online. Huey was ballsy and smart. He knew the law and encouraged everyone in the community, especially the Panthers, to follow suit. They were let go without incident, and membership exploded. Armed patrols of the police spread. The purpose of this was to educate the civilians. They carried law books with them and to dissuade any uh, police misconduct. Awesome, dude. That's great. That's yeah. like why I carry the fucking little constitution booklet. Yeah, I got one I got one myself. Good boy, dude. Freaking, <laughs> that's why I'm telling the kids or whatever of like, hey, dude, if you ever get pulled over, this is this is what they're allowed to do. This is what they're allowed to not do. Right. There was one There was one time, I'm not sure if it was this story or another incident, but there was one time where like an officer asked Huey a question. He just said five. He's like, what? Five? He's like, five. Number five, the Fifth Amendment. Yeah. I'm not going to tell you. <laughs> As in like, fuck off. Like. <laughs> Fun fact. The Panthers, uh, like the KKK at the time, acquired some of their weapons through the military. They were both fearful of a civil war or perhaps a post-nuke war. They acquired their weapons through the military? Through the mili- not officially, but like people in the military would sell them weapons like under the table. Ah, of yes. course. So they had like military, some military grade, grade weapons. Grade weapons. So automatic rifles. Yes, basically. Gotcha. Another fun fact, uh, the Panthers were inspired by Marxist ideals. They sold copy of yes. Mao Zedong's Little Red Book to students to fund their efforts. And the Little Red Book contains the phrase, famously contains the phrase, political power grows out of the barrel of a gun. Because mm-hmm. Mao said that, basically. He was yep. like, it doesn't really matter, basically, what your ideals are. Is Force is the only thing that matters. Yeah. The founders thought of themselves as uh, colonists being colonized by a corrupted system of capitalism. And that the police were like the 
like the Red Army basically inside yes. hassling them. Totally. It's interesting because um, I, as I was kind of digging more into Fred Hampton, I kind of realized that he was like a hardcore socialist kind of quasi Marxist. Yeah, that it spread throughout. It was kind of core to their whole fundamental thing. beliefs and stuff yeah. like that, which we'll go and kind of into and whatever. One thing that I he said that um, I, I would like to kind of push back on or whatever is that since he kind of brought this up, is that okay. he said that racism is a byproduct of capitalism. Mm. Which I kind of think is like oversimplifying things. You know what I mean? I think that it's a more of a byproduct of this animalistic side of human nature, uh, tribalism. You yeah. know what I mean? For sure. Um, I would, I would say that it's not necessarily racism, but definitely classism. classism. See, mm. and that's, that's kind of interesting about this whole thing is that where they were talking about the kind of classic Marxism of classism and, and the bourgeoisie and the proletariat and mm. the haves and have nots and kind mm. of a thing. Today's, co- today's movement kind of took that and piggybacked on the coattails of that and kind of changed everything from classism, a class hierarchy to a racial hierarchy. Okay. They just kind of changed a couple of things or whatever. This new kind of critical race theory, um, intersectionality movement that's kind of been going on lately and stuff. And right. uh, I just thought that it was kind of bizarre that Fred Hampton was into like f- Marxism and socialism because, you know, I-, I would go as far as to say that socialism kind of requires dependency on the state. Hmm. You know what I mean? This, it's the state that gives you everything okay, from right. socialism, or whatever. And I find like another word for dependency is basically soft slavery. You know what I mean? Yeah, so it's I kind think, of a weird like combination that, yeah. that he was. I, I get what he was saying of like, dude, we don't have any power and stuff, and we need that. We, the power needs to be returned to the people. I totally agree with that. Mm-hmm. I just think that his parts of his ideology, I think, were just kind of flawed. And mm-hmm. I would love. To, you wish you could talk to Fred Hampton. Well, not only that, but I wish I got to see the evolution of his ideas. Mm-hmm. Because I guarantee you, if he was alive today, seeing mm-hmm. everything that had happened and the you know subsequent you know decades that happened afterward, mm-hmm. I feel like he would have changed his opinion or whatever. Not maybe not a hundred percent, but definitely would have like evolved his his thinking and narrative of the situation for sure. Yeah. I didn't dig too far deep into the philosophy of all these people, but I I definitely see your point, and I think a lot of them kind of more just romanticize the Marxist idea of like, everybody's kind of equal rather than like, you know, the, then the like factoid then, of it all, or, or uh, the de facto like nature of it all. Right. And the other, the other thing you got to remember is what time this is taking place in. That's right. kind of a rising idea. Big time. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. And we haven't seen, we were doing a lot of terrible shit too, dude, as far as like just living up to the ideals of freaking of the nation, the promises of our founding fathers and stuff. But dude, the draft, yeah. the, fr- you know, just like everything, dude, it was, it was, it was needed to be pushed back. You yeah. know what I mean? Like absolutely a hundred percent needed and stuff. And there's one thing that I agree with him on a hundred percent is that we are divided into groups and pitted against each other. Oh yeah. That was the one thing that he mm-hmm. really was like um, adamant about forming that rainbow coalition of oppressed peoples of all fucking can colors. We ta- stuff, can dude. we table this to later? Cause I, yeah. I totally agree no, with what you're saying. No, 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 <laughs> I, I, no, no, I, I'm, I'm totally down or whatever. I just think that that's hilarious or whatever that this dude was so ahead of his time because what he's talking about now, it, what he's talking about then is identity politics. Oh, yeah. Which is literally what's like gripping everybody today and mm-hmm. stuff like that. If saying like, oh, hey, put people into these little boxes and stuff so they can be identified. But at the same time, it separates people. Mm-hmm. And it kind of it allows the people up top to be like, ha ha, like keep fighting amongst yourselves, you little fucking peons exactly. or whatever, while we keep running the game. Exactly. Firearms were an essential part of the movement. They saw it as their key to freedom. And yes. they referred to it as such. Uh, so the California lawmakers weren't having it. Representative Don Mulford from Oakland introduced the Mulford Act, which aimed to outlaw loaded public carrying. Loaded. Loaded public carrying. Which so is you what just they couldn't had. have one in the chamber? I know, I know your feelings. <laughs> you know on how this I feel about these through. laws, Marcus. This is ridiculous <laughs> but laws. But it was basically to counter what the Panthers were doing. Okay. Or um, attempt to, at least. Right. So Bobby led a protest at the Capitol. Uh, they happened to run into Governor state Reagan, capital or the, the state capital. Okay. They happened to run into Governor Reagan, Ronald Reagan, who was giving a speech on the lawn to some like uh, elementary school kids, and the media kind of gathered around them because they're like, "What the hell's happening here?" Right. Of course. Yeah. And then like Reagan's people like rushed him the fuck out of there. Bobby spoke to the media. Read, he read a statement, and then his delegation went inside to observe the legislature debating the bill. According to Bobby, they accidentally walked onto the floor of the assembly instead of the observer section, and <laughs> chaos ensued. Yeah, totally. Whoops. Yeah. Sorry. What are these black lads doing down here with their firearms? Yeah. I do declare. Fun fact, the NRA supported the Mulford Act, which you and I know is the old NRA, like the pre, <laughs> right. pre-77 coup and the pro, pro-gun control NRA. Yeah, totally. The, the bad NRA. Yeah. <laughs> well, and, you know. 
questionable NRA. <laughs> and, uh, and Reagan called guns at the time a ridiculous way to solve problems. Powerful irony here, because that's how he solved some of his problems. I was going to lay, like, I was going to say, like, during the whole thing with, like, Khrushchev and everything, I'm like, that's, I mean, a nuclear bomb is basically just a big-ass gun. I mean, it seemed to do fine there. <laughs> Not to mention the Iran-Contra. Oh, well, that whole thing, yeah, yeah, guns for money and drugs. Yeah, yeah well, you know, I mean, as you do. And uh, the media kind of had a field day with this. They basically ignored their message of self-defense and just played up the fact that there were armed Negroes running around. Oh, can't have that. Yeah. Honey, have you read this? Yeah. Uh, apparently, <laughs> the fucking police are beating up these Negroes like, like hotcakes. Hot <laughs> uh, so the Mulford, big issue. Yeah, the Mulford Act passed in July of 67, and many other laws followed, arguably targeting the Black Panther Party. So the Mulford Act was that one that we were just talking about, about loaded weapons, mm -hmm. right? About loaded weapons, yeah. Yeah. Uh, however, membership continued to expand nationwide. As some people saw scary black guys with guns, some other people were like... Scary oh. black guys with scary guns. Yeah. Uh, some other people saw, oh my God, these people are actually doing something about all this crap. Right. Totally. They're yeah. not, uh, not just talking. Yeah. And the Panthers even saw some international support. This setback effectively stopped the armed police patrols, but the Panthers still stockpiled firearms and continued their firearms training. As, as you do. Yeah. So, fun fact, you might have seen that, that famous peacock throne image of Huey with the, the spear oh. in the one hand and the gun. On yeah, the yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, so that picture was taken shortly after this event, as Huey's friend and fellow leader Eldridge Cleaver knew that he could capitalize on this moment. Totally. Uh, Good PR moment. Yeah. Reportedly, Huey actually didn't like the photo, as he said it misrepresented the party. Mm. So uh, another fun fact, just kind of building off of that one, Eldridge Cleaver was appointed the Minister of Information. He was, like, in charge of, like, all their publications and stuff like that. Totally. Huey was the Minister of Defense. Bobby was the chairman. And Donald Cox helped with firearms, training, and law. He was eventually dubbed Field Marshal. Awesome. So basically, they're kind of creating their own little, like, system, almost kind of like a, like a military kind of, where you have to, yeah. you, you assign people, you know, their um, positions Ranks. and process. Yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. Or, or, you know, to do whatever they need to do. Like, okay, you're, you're in charge of security. You kind of make sure we're fucking all safe or whatever. You're in charge of fucking numbers. Make sure that we have enough money and finance and stuff. Mm -hmm. You're in charge of PR. Fucking make sure yeah. blah, blah, blah. Uh, Eldridge Cleaver and Donald Cox actually had military experience. So that nice. was kind of their thing. So now we get into Act Two, where the story takes a dark turn, unfortunately. So as you and I know, and as our listeners know, the FBI set its sights on the Black Panther Party as part of the co-intel pro. Yeah, we talked about that in our second episode. Two. episode. Yeah, mm -hmm. well done. Call back. Yep. FBI Director J. Edgar Hoover said, quote, the Black J Panther... J. Edna Hoover? Edna? <laughs> Did you, I say Edna? No, no, no. no. You know the joke? No. Well, he was a cross-dresser, right? He was oh, like yeah. A closeted he was, yeah, gay, he's very closeted. Maybe closet not gay, but like, yeah. Cr he had some kind of picatillos that mm -hmm. fucking he wouldn't want left out or whatever. So that's like the joke or whatever. Oh, like, okay. yeah, J. Edna Hoover. J. Gosh, yeah, gosh, sorry. Gosh. I didn't mean to do that. <laughs> no, it's cool. I apologize. It's cool. I was wondering whether or not to throw this in here as like a joke of like, he was just so mad. At, I don't know. <laughs> I couldn't come up with anything great, but... Um, so yeah, anyway. All the pieces there. Somebody do, it. Somebody, <laughs> somebody do something with it. FBI Director J. Edgar Hoover was quoted as saying, the Black Panther Party, without question, represents the greatest threat to internal security of the country. What year was this? Probably like 65? Late, or late 60s. Yeah, late, yeah. yeah. That's hilarious. So we've moved was... off of communism now, no, I guess. That, yeah, that, <laughs> right, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Now, now for the internal struggle. Mm -hmm. Cunt. Oh, here's another quote from a mem from an FBI memo. Uh, Careful attention must be given to the proposal to ensure the targeted group is disrupted, ridiculed, or discredited. Mm -hmm. I'm going to post in the description links to these direct documents so you can read them for yourself. It's funny to me that like this is all like hell of old, declassified, like super old mainstream news, mm -hmm. and yet today. If you were to say something like negative about the FBI, oh, kind of course they wouldn't yeah. do oh, that. That oh, institution is that is beyond corruption. And blah, blah, blah. you're like, dude, come on. Yeah, this was like 50 years ago, right. dude. <laughs> Obviously, there's still going to be some kind of corrupt. I mean, maybe it's not racial now, but it's definitely going to be some kind of corruption and ideology like battling in between. For sure, these uh, you know these uh, uh, institutions, especially when you know there's a whole competing in between the institutions for like funding and everything. Oh my like god, that totally, on. dude. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Never ends. Yeah. So of the 295 actions against uh, black nationalist groups, 233 of them were against the Panthers. Damn. So the Panthers just taking all the Yeah, they were a big target. Yeah. Mm -hmm. mm. It's probably the guns. Yeah. Well, I mean, yeah. <laughs> I found it's the, it's the fact that they're black and guns, right? It's a <laughs> double whammy, Marcus. I couldn't really uh, prove it, but um, I heard that over 7 million in bribes were paid to FBI informants which is twice as much as they paid to those in the mafia. And that's on the books though, right? Like, right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like what's off the books. Dude? Yeah. yeah. I couldn't find a source on that, but no, of course um, it wouldn't really be that surprising. I wouldn't either dude. Tales old as time. So I don't um, think they're called bribes, Marcus. I think they're called something else. Freedom kickbacks. There it is. There it is. <laughs> 
In October 67, Huey was involved in a police shooting. The details on the case are highly contested. We right. won't get into them here. But right. the facts are that Officer John Fry, and it's spelled Frey, but they, well, I heard that uh, people pronounce it as Fry. He must be French. I don't know. John, you know how they are. Yeah. <laughs> officer John Fry was shot and killed. A second officer, Herbert Haynes, was shot three times and survived. Right. And Huey was shot in the stomach. Right. So what is clear is that Huey became kind of a living martyr for this. Yeah, a legend. He exemplified the movement. The slogan, Free Huey, was everywhere. His freedom was the movement's freedom. It was a pretty crazy time. His arrest ignited or reignited some people. And while Huey sat in jail, his contemporaries anticipated his execution or his release. Yeah. So that's what the kind of a thing about holding somebody that like important culturally mm-hmm. and politically is like, bro, if you guys just like fart wrong, dude, you're going to piss off a lot of people. Uh-huh. You know what I mean? You're going to make a martyr out of this motherfucker. Right. So it's really incumbent upon you to proceed with caution. Yeah. And as we'll talk about later, the FBI was afraid of... You know, people like Huey for... And also Fred Hampton, which yes. uh, we're going to be talking about gonna, later. They were waiting for his release or his execution, which, as fucked up as it is, it kind of would have been a boon to the movement. Because, for sure. Because, you know, if he was killed, they'd be like, okay. Living martyr, dude. Yeah. Fuck, yeah. He's a living martyr or he's a dead martyr. Yeah, but either yeah, way, yeah. he's a fucking martyr. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It would, it would provide fuel for the movement, for mm-hmm. sure. And the people who supported the officers wanted his execution as vindication for the police officers and to make an example of him. <laughs> Short-sighted morons. Right. And so I'm going to put my tinfoil hat, put on my tinfoil hat here. On the left. Right, right, right. That's the zinc one. Um, there, there, right. That one. This Good. one's a blend, synthetic blend. Ooh. Um, this one's copper. It's a little more conductive. <laughs> so it's like the exact opposite of what you oh, want. What you for want. For <laughs> <laughs> so uh, perhaps that's why the verdict actually spared him the death penalty in favor of incarceration. So they basically uh, just wanted to jail totally him. They totally realized that yeah. like, oh, if we kill this guy, there's going to be a lot of pissed off fucking mm-hmm. people. So the middle ground, what neither buddy, what neither party wanted, they just, you know, left him to rot in jail. Yeah, totally. That's the easy, that's the easy decision, right? Just put yeah. him there, and we can kind of kick the buck down the road. And I heard the story, but I couldn't find a source on it, so I don't know if I'm going to include it. But um, yeah, so two angry police officers drove by a Black Panther headquarters in Oakland, and they fired some shots into the building. They hit a throne poster, you know, the picture gotcha. of him on the throne, right? Uh, which then became sort of another symbol. You know, ah, the throne poster with the holes with in it. Bullet or holes in it. That's kind of yeah. cool. I'm not gonna lie. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, fundraisers, donations, and membership rise yet again. And let's do a theme check here of that whole opportunity out of tragedy. Totally. So anyway, in '68, uh, Eldridge Cleaver published his book "Soul on Ice," which he wrote in prison while he was in prison in '65. Oh, soul on ice. Soul on, on ice, ice. ice in prison. Okay. Yeah. So it's not like a uh, <laughs> like a, a musical performed on like skating. Okay. Gotcha. Gotcha. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Sorry. 68 was a bad year for civil rights, and the Panthers were unfortunately no exception. Robert Kennedy and Dr. King were both assassinated, yeah. and riots followed. Yeah. Yeah. I think it was uh, Kennedy 65. in 63, Alcom X in 65, mm-hmm. uh, Martin Luther King in 68. 68. Yeah. God damn. Yeah. I mean, dude, think about that. Like Bobby Kennedy also in 68, I think. I'm not sure. I have to look that back up again. Yeah, but I mean, just think about it. Like, all these people you look up to, all your heroes are just getting fucking axed left and right. Yeah, dude. 60 to to 70 was just social chaos, dude. They were just picking off our social, cultural leaders one by one. Yeah, I mean, people people standing up and be like, hey, we deserve better. Um, Then they're getting killed. (laughs) Kill that guy. Maybe we should stop, like, you know, thinking that we deserve better. Yeah, right. Totally. That we deserve a fair shake. Jesus. Yeah. It's messed up, man. I wouldn't want to be living through that time. You know? Nope. I was right. 68. Bam. Okay, cool. Fucking Great job, Drew. Yeah. Good job, Drew. Right. <laughs> Fucking idiot. <laughs> Fucking Kennedy family, man. Dude. Jesus. Just keeps going. So, uh, with Huey incarcerated and Bobby Seale facing trial in Chicago as part of the Chicago 8, which is another fucking rabbit hole. That's a crazy story. Totally. That's the one where uh, Bobby couldn't pick his lawyer and he was ordered bound and gagged. Damn. Yeah, that's fucked up. Uh, like so, literally gag, not yeah. like, hey, in, don't in the say anything, room, the like judge full was on, like, put fucking, a fucking piece of tape mm-hmm. on his mouth. God damn. Yeah. Yeah. Judge did not like him. Uh, Eldridge Cleaver, uh, which is the guy who organized the throne photo, um, he became the de facto leader. And in 68, Cleaver caught his own case. So I won't go too deep into the details on this one, but Cleaver was angered by the murder of MLK. Mm-hmm. And this is one of the things that I I guess I sort of understand, but I don't agree with it. I'm not going to try to shy away from some of the bad things that the Panthers did because there were certainly, I mean, with any organization. It's a war, dude. Yeah, for sure. For I, sure. It's I a, totally get it. Yeah. Human beings are flawed, dude. Right. And so like... Cleaver kind of went against the whole self-defense thing, like don't shoot unless shot upon type of thing. 
he uh, led an ambush on two police officers. And that uh, resulted in a shootout. He was more of a, like, uh, take the fight to them kind of a thing. Yeah. If, I mean, if we're in it, might as well take it to them. Yeah, I mean, they just I, murdered MLK. I so get it, he, too, bro. I don't agree either, but I yeah. get it. I totally get it. So I um, understand it, at least, I, I mean. Yeah, so that evolved into a shootout, which wounded two officers, and the Panthers eventually surrendered. Uh, 17-year-old Lil Bobby, which is that other guy we talked about right. before, Lil Bobby Hutton, was shot by the police uh, two weeks before his 18th birthday. Mm. And the police would say that he ignored orders and tried to run. Uh, according to Eldridge Cleaver, they shot him with his hands up while they were doing a strip search. Mm. Uh, Eldridge Cleaver fled to Algeria via Canada and Cuba, and he worked on the Black Panthers' international efforts while he was there. Uh, fun fact, at, uh, at Little Bobby's funeral, the 17-year-old kid. Right. Uh, not at his Bobby, funeral. Um, Bobby Hutton. Hutton, yes. Yeah. Uh, after his funeral, there was uh, kind of a gathering uh, in Oakland. Uh, one of the people who spoke was uh, Marlon Brando. I'm gonna send. Are I'm you gonna, gonna put a link. say it in the vo- in the Marlon Brando voice? No, I'm gonna I'm gonna put a link uh, of that. A few people uh, speaking. So with two of the leaders out of the picture, the FBI decided to pounce, sort of like a panther. <laughs> a panther on on like a wounded prey on ice. <laughs> they, <laughs> they, the the FBI intercepted and created mail between members and their families. Uh, sometimes faking official material. Mm, Writing Um, letters and stuff that are not real. mm -hmm. They tried to create infighting between the Panthers and other organizations such as the U.S., most famously, and the Blackstone Rangers, Mm. using co-opted imagery and cartoons. Uh, Ironically, they were even, like, accusing each other of working with the FBI. Of course. When, of course, it was all fabricated by the FBI. Yep, totally infighting. Yeah, and they were uh, actually successful at this, as we'll see later. They beat and coerced members into becoming informants. They planted agent provocateurs. Yeah. They raided headquarters, uh, sometimes resulting in deaths and arrests where the members were subsequently released because they couldn't actually convict them because there was a bunch of bullshit charges. Totally. They were purely just intimidation tactics. Right. Most famously, in 1969, the LAPD used their first SWAT unit to raid the LA Panther headquarters, and it resulted in a four-hour standoff. Damn. Which is pretty interesting, because if you see the building that the LA Panther headquarters is in, it was a small building. So, like, I guess they the, they rushed in there, and then the Panthers were sort of prepared for them, so they started shooting at them, and then they retreated, and then there was just like, this back-and-forth volley. Mm-hmm. An account I read that said 300 officers involved, over 500 rounds expelled, 13 arrests made. Three Panthers and three officers were wounded. Mm. Uh, The SWAT even deployed explosives, like on the roof, and they even had like a tank. And somehow, uh, MRAB. Yeah. Yeah. uh, Somehow, uh, miraculously, no deaths resulted from this. Thank God. Yeah. I heard another report that I couldn't substantiate that said a Panther shot first, and this turned out to be an FBI informant named David Cotton. Well, that's going to be a that recurring up. theme for what we talk about later with Fred Hampton. Yeah, the FBI definitely had people in the organization and around it. That's pretty classic, actually. If you know about the FBI, yeah, it became the joke of like you can't go to a <laughs> can't go to a uh, white supremacist meeting without fucking um, or something about like swinging a stick or whatever at a white supremacist meeting <laughs> without and, hitting an without FBI hitting agent. like nine FBI agents. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like if there's ten people there, nine of them are fucking FBI agents. Yeah. You know and what especially I mean? you think about like. Not only were they like beating and coercing people and threatening them, you know, but they also even just the power of a bribe to these fucking poor people dude, could be super powerful. Big time, dude. It's- and they'd be like, hey, look at what happened to Malcolm X. Look at what happened to MLK. Yep. yep. That could do happen. you want to end up like that? Yeah, exactly. Or do you just want to fucking raise your family and freaking, you know, uh, and we'll live protect in peace you. and stuff like that? We can actually help you with that. You know exactly. what I mean? Here's some, you know, here's some money. Mm-hmm. So another fun fact, or maybe a funny fact, uh, the LAPD's Daryl Gates. His SWAT team initially, they weren't the first SWAT team. The first one was in Philadelphia, I believe. But okay. the LAPD SWAT, as he envisioned it, uh, initially stood for Special Weapons Attack Team. Right. And his his, his uh, deputy like tapped him on the shoulder. He's like, hey, um, you know, you're, you're saying the quiet part out loud. Don't say attack. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Say something cooler. Yeah. So um, Less lethal. Right. So another fun fact. These aren't really fun facts, but I'm calling <laughs> another it. Another fact. Factoid. Uh, <laughs> COINTELPRO targeted other movements such as the Young Lords, the Brown Berets, and Students for a Democratic Society. As we briefly mentioned in Episode 2, they wiretapped and bugged MLK. Under the flimsy justification that his aides had communist ties, and in my opinion, it was really just Hoover's racism. Yeah, no, completely. They tried to tie him to all that like Black Panther shit, too, but like MLK was smart enough to be like, um... I'm not going to, at least officially, like, att- attach myself to these guys because of the kind of the negative connotation that's kind of attached to them. Right. So, therefore, you can't fucking, whatever they do is separate from me, dude. You can't fucking bring their shit on to me. Right, right. They had an informant, like, on his team. No way. Yeah. <laughs> oh, so they sent some of these wiretapped recordings uh, to him along with the threatening letter. And I will actually link to the letter. It's pretty awful. You talk about MLK? Yeah. 
Yeah, where they're like, "Hey, basically, uh, we know what you're doing, and we know <laughs> we Let's know you've been smooching up on stuff. your on your on your side piece, and we know that your wife wouldn't really like that, so you should fucking kill yourself, basically, yeah. you piece of shit." Yeah. Uh, the letter has been released, but the tapes have been ordered sealed until 2027. Right. The Coretta, his wife, she heard the tapes and she said there was right. just a lot of mumbo jumbo. Like, yeah, it wasn't really. Well, she said that they tried to freaking like show these tapes to kind of to to win her over mm. onto their side, and it just made her go like. No, fuck you guys. Like, okay, yeah, dude, my husband fucking like talks to other chicks. Fuck you. Like, whoop de doo, dude. Like, our ideology and our movement is far deeper than this nonsense you're trying to pull on us, dude. Like, nice try, but fuck off with that. (laughs) Come back at me with something better. And that's the thing. Like, even if it's true, like, okay. Well, it's pretty much, it's pretty much historically agreed to be true, but it it, it doesn't matter. What is the, the, no, exactly. Like, what does that have to do with anything? Nothing, dude. You're going to try to smear me on something that's completely unrelated. Mm hmm. That just shows your desperation, the fact that you're going to try to muddy the waters, dude, because you know that what I'm saying has merit, dude. Right. And you're afraid of that. Yeah. Yeah, but they framed it as like, I am I used to follow you and believe in you, and I think, you know, oh, fuck off. pretending <laughs> to be a black dude. like <laughs> Pretending to be black? <laughs> yeah. What is this, know. Joe Biden? You ain't black if you ain't voting for me, bro. Yeah, exactly. Fuck off. So, um, in 68 and 69, Bobby Seale wrote uh, Seize the Time, which is the book that I've been quoting it, and it right. was published in 1970. In the late 60s, the Black Panther Party branched out to community outreach. This was kind of hard because of the negative media coverage they were getting and yeah. was, was kind of pushing public opinion against them. Uh, out of the concept of revolutionary intercommunalism, they developed over 60 what they called survival programs. So these included things like free clothing, home maintenance programs, uh, health screening, sickle cell testing, immunizations, child care, legal help, and even a senior self-defense program. Awesome. Yeah. Fun fact, these signature programs were often staffed and supported by white people, who were usually middle class. That's usually pretty standard, though, because it's just the amount of population. For sure. I mean? Just like, a numbers thing. For dem- yeah, exactly. Yeah. But, you know, they did, they the did have support. No, of course. And that's one, of the, like, what's one of my what's one of my favorite things that uh, MLK said in his I Have a Dream speech, where he basically said, like, look around you, dude. Fucking, the person you'll left, notice. The person right. Yeah, like, yeah. you'll notice that our fucking white brothers and sisters are here today because they fucking agree with us. They, yeah. they say that they realize that. Our freedom, meaning the black community, is inextricably co- uh, connected to their freedom, which is yeah. fucking the white community or whatever. You know what I mean? Like basically saying we're all Americans and if we're only as strong as our weakest link. You For know sure. I and mean? with the first, what did Picard say? With the first link, the chain is forged. No, no. The first time we don't like um, live up to our expectations or whatever that we promised or whatever, the first time we do that to anybody, we're all damaged. Yeah. Because we're all connected dude, to the right? chain. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. A lot of these things at the time were kind of largely ignored by the media. They wanted to push more of the uh, the whole violent people with guns thing. Yeah, totally. And uh, Dangerous Negroes with firearms. Right. I'm going to quote from the Huey P. Newton story film. Not because it's necessarily factual. I just like the way that he says it. You don't read about the survival programs we're doing for the people or the free children's breakfast program trying to feed some of these hungry kids before they go off to school in the morning. The educational programs we had going on for these kids, for the older folks as well. You don't read about that. The shoe giveaway, the clothing giveaway, the coat giveaway we had going on back east so people don't freeze to death during the winter months. The free prison busing program where we bus people to the, from the community out to the prison, the penitentiary, so the people can visit their loved ones right. who are incarcerated. You don't read about that. You don't read about the free ambulance service that we had going on in Winston-Salem, North Carolina, because black people in Winston-Salem, North Carolina, were denied basic emergency health care. You don't read about that. You don't read about the free sickle cell anemia testing program where we tested over 500,000, half a million people before the U.S. government even realized sickle cell anemia was a threat to the well-being of black people in America. Hmm. You don't read about that. Why? Because there's no sensationalism there. No right. dramatic value. It right. doesn't sell newspapers. Right. It doesn't boost the television ratings. It's just some black people getting organized to help some other black people. Good for them. No, yeah. but for real, though. <laughs> yeah. That's one thing that I really liked uh, that he said when he was giving his speech for the rallying support of uh, the Breakfast for Children program. Um, was Fred Hampton? The, yeah, exactly. Yeah. It was at the um, Black Panther Party uh, was going to have to do more than just talk. Uh-huh. He was saying, like, um, you know, we're going to have to go and do more than just listen. We're going to have to do more than just talk. We're going to have to learn. And that, you know, that reminds me of like what fucking Killer Mike said to this uh, to this group of people, basically, w- where he was talking about self-reliance before revolution, mm-hmm. where he was saying, like, all you guys are talking about, you know, sending your young kids out into the streets to fight the police or to fight the oppressors or whatever mm-hmm. the fuck. But how many of you know how to defend yourself with a firearm? How many of you know how to fucking grow your own food? Yeah, like you can't how throw over you... this thing No, with nothing dude, if you have nothing behind it, it yeah. dude. Yeah, you have to know how to do all these things 
so that you can replace mm -hmm. this fucked up system or whatever. Right. You can't replace the system and be like, ah, oh, we're just going to wing whatever comes next. Yeah. That's ridiculous. That's, that's how problems happen. Right. So, uh, speaking of the media, the Panthers had sort of a tumultuous relationship with the media, you could say. Hmm. They had their own publications, as I mentioned, but uh, obviously the mainstream media had a bigger reach. For sure. They often portrayed them as racist domestic terrorists, but the Panthers knew that they could help them spread their message and potentially highlight their issues. So they kind of played ball, but it didn't always work out. So they kind of painted them, I feel like, as a overgeneralizing as them all being um, black ethno-nationalists. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Which there were those groups. No, no, of course. No, no. But like I said, painting all of them yeah. to be that or whatever. Yeah, Whereas exactly. it's like, no, we don't necessarily agree that the whole country should be like black supremacist or yeah, no, no. Exactly. We, just, we just want fucking equality or whatever. Though there are those groups. We just want you fucking, to stop killing us. Yeah. If it's not fucking too much to ask. <laughs> there was a cover for Newsweek that they were shooting. Okay. And the, the guys wanted to dress up in like suits or something. And then the, the, the like suits and ties. Yeah. Yeah. So, and then the photographers were like, no, no, no. Can you, can you put on like the, the leather jackets and the berets and, the, yeah, and yeah, shit? Yeah. yeah. Can yeah, you so. put up your fist and fucking not smile, please? And they're like, oh, okay, I guess. Yeah. Which is hilarious because fucking... it's like, you should push back against that and be like, no, we're going to portray however the fuck we want to portray. And if we want to fucking have suits and ties to have everybody be like, oh, these guys are okay. Mm -hmm. You know, for, for image and shit, but then you should do that, you know? Yeah. But the same people who would pick up Newsweek wouldn't pick up the edition of the Black Panther. You That's true. Saying? You need to, yeah. People writing for like Jacobin magazine aren't going to be fucking, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Aren't going to be fucking, you know, or reading the same, like the New York Times or whatever. Mm -hmm. I, I agree. But, that's why PR is so important, dude. For you need sure. to have somebody who's like, "Oh, hey, what what outlet is this? Okay, let's let's maybe not change our message, but let's package it mm -hmm. into a way that's more um, digestible For to sure. the people that are reading those magazines." For sure. Uh, so the most notorious of these survival programs was the school breakfast program. Yes. Disinformation was actually spread against this and other programs, and sometimes even more serious acts occurred, uh, with Oakland, Baltimore, and Chicago bearing the worst opposition. The Panthers were accused of serving infected food and indoctrinating children to become racist. Well, I mean, I mean, it's subjective with that last part of fucking okay. talking about indoctrination and shit. People okay. are like, it's a brainwashing camp. You're like, ah. or it's an education like thing to kind of get people to understand. It's the hearts things. and minds. Yeah, totally. Definitely. It's hard to, it's, it, ah, that was one thing when I was getting into that I was kind of torn on because kids are so susceptible to, the things that it's really hard to like really determine what is the right thing to be teaching the kids. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Mm -hmm. And one could argue that like, well, when you're living in this kind of a situation, it's, it is the right thing to tell them like, Hey, you're oppressed. These are your oppressors. This is how you need to fucking fight back against that shit mm -hmm. and whatever. But I, I get, I get the pushback of that too, of like, well, this is the same thing we talked about before. You don't want to teach them like victimhood, especially. You want to make them aware of their surroundings of without making them chained to this victimhood mentality. Right. Totally like they're agree. never going to get out they're of it. Never going to get out of it. So just, you know, it's don't even try. It's Whitey's right. fault. Fucking, right. you know what I mean? Right. Yeah. Uh, police raids took place even during, even sometimes during breakfast with the children present and with oh, guns drawn. Dude. Yeah. That's as one Panther recalled the night before it was supposed to go open. The Chicago police broke into the church where we had all the food and mashed up all the food and urinated on it. <laughs> so we had to delay the opening. But damn, if that's true, that Jesus, bro, yeah, really? Right. But what what that caused was just all kinds of attention, and people were just lining up to give us donations. Right, dude. Again, Good. opportunity Good. out of tragedy. Yes, dude, exactly. So this program in particular highlighted the weakness of the existing uh, federal breakfast program, which expanded in response and became permanent in '75. Fun fact and full disclosure: the Panthers would boycott and occasionally strong arm businesses that wouldn't help them with their social programs. Mm -hmm. I understand the boycott. Maybe the strong arm is maybe not the best uh, best Again, maneuver. Yeah, you yeah. got the mafia for fuck's sake. Come on, dude. Right. Throughout this whole thing, like uh, I tried to be uh, objective and fair and. You should view all these things in in their totality. Right. Even even if I support Not a lot of the things, even yeah. if I support a lot of the things that the Agreed. Panthers are doing, there's sometimes there's some things they just have definitely went too far. Well, or, like we were saying, dude, people are uh, people are layered. Yeah, you know what I mean. It's uh, it's not a uh, well, this guy was a good guy or this guy was a bad guy thing. Mm -hmm. Okay, so remember how I said the FBI were successful in creating tension between groups? True, with like disinform sowing disinformation and distrust through each other's groups or whatever, of course, divide and conquer. This was definitely seen in January of 1969, in which a fight broke out at a meeting of the UCLA's Black Student Union between members of the organization U.S. and the Black Panther Party. This resulted in the death of Panther's apprentice, Bunchy Carter, hmm. who founded the L.A. chapter, and John Huggins. Damn, it died? Yeah. Subsequent killings between the groups occurred, and, you know, it's just like retaliation mm -hmm. kind of things going on. Infighting, right? Yep. 
And the violence, which is predicated by the FBI, I'll remind you, certainly didn't help public opinion. For sure. Just look how violent these groups are. Yeah, exactly. Look at these guys. They can't coexist amongst themselves. Yeah. Fun fact, Tupac's mother was a Black Panther. Right. Uh, Adnita Shakur. Yeah. And Elmer Geronimo Pratt was his godfather. Hmm. Uh, Pratt served in Vietnam and was in practice the true minister of defense. He was a proven co-Intel Pro target. Hmm. He served 27 years in prison, eight in solitary. Damn. For a murder that he did not commit. Oh, my God. Yeah. He was denied parole 19 times. And uh, Tupac died before he was released. Totally. Yeah. Okay, actual fun fact. Uh, his lawyer was Johnny Cochran. Oh, my God. That yeah. piece of shit, really? Yeah, Johnny oh, Cochran uh, represented a lot of uh, Panthers. Actually. Damn, that's how he got cut that's his teeth in the movement. Mm-hmm. Yeah. What a fucking slimy piece of shit, dude. <laughs> I'm sorry. Just learning that, dude. And then you're going to do what you did or whatever, working with the OJ. Like, dude, you fucking betrayer. Like, yeah. what a piece of shit. All right, so now we're going to get to the man himself, Fred Hampton. Yeah, boy. So, Fred was born in 1948 in Illinois. Mm -hmm. He was an activist from a young age. Uh, He became a youth organizer for the NAACP. He joined the Panthers in 1968. Uh, He eventually assumed leadership of the Illinois chapter. So, in order to really tell Fred Hampton's story, we kind of got to give a background on what was going on in Chicago at the time. What kind of world he stepped into. Yeah, set the stage. So, there was obviously like the Great Migration into places like Chicago, but there was... People came to Chicago for all kinds of, from all kinds of places for opportunities. Right. Economic opportunities. Right. But the established neighborhoods kind of resisted outsiders of all kinds, not just black people. For sure. Of course. It was, uh, As you do. it was a very segregated city at the time. A uh, fun fact, Dr. King once said, I've been in many demonstrations all across the South, but I can say that I have never seen, even in Mississippi and Alabama, mobs as hostile and as hate filled as I've seen in Chicago. Damn. Yeah, so Chicago faced the riots after the after the Democratic National Convention of sixty. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, the the King Sasha Nation riots, and then the Days of Rage in sixty nine. So yeah. it was not a good place to be. It's the cold. <laughs> the cold. Plus, they got the shittier pizza there. Yeah. Right. Everybody knows New York style's best. You know. Yeah. <laughs> Fuck that deep dish <laughs> nonsense. <laughs> That's not pizza. I'm it's just like a kidding. pie, if anything. I'm just kidding. I love all kinds of pizza. No, I love too, right? Yeah. <laughs> Fred Hampton negotiated peace deals between Chicago's gangs. He was, by all accounts, a very charismatic person. And seriously, dear listener, look up some of his speeches because this dude, yeah. dude can speak. Yeah. yeah. It's uh, it's kind of a telling reason why uh, what happened to targeted. him happened to him. Mm-hmm. Yeah. At such a young age is because of the level of fear that the authorities had of this individual yeah so along with some others he helped found the rainbow coalition right which was a multi-ethnic group they weren't like an official like organization with like positions or anything like yeah, that yeah. it was just, just kind group, of a movement a group of disenfranchised people of all colors and walks of life and yeah stuff black all, hispanic yep. native american white totally um i, I freaking tear up learning about it dude right uh, Hampton knew that the powers that be, specifically the mayor, the police, uh, the Chicago PD, and the state attorney, wanted infighting between the poor so that they could consolidate power, justify brutality, and keep their minds off of their conditions and who's really the, who the yeah. real enemy is. Yeah, divide and conquer. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, we kind of talked about this briefly in our uh, prisons episode when we were talking mm-hmm. about that um, that Chicago like black site, basically. Yeah. The police chief and his little underlings would like kidnap people and torture them and interrogate them and stuff completely under... Uh, or, or, or I should say without any scrutiny, you know, yeah. not under any kind of, um, you in know, a place that no one knew about. Yeah, exactly, dude. And all that stuff was, uh, was able to, uh, breed in Chicago because of how corrupt Chicago was, dude. Yeah. And, you know, any story you hear about, like, just like the horror stories and like the myths of like, oh, that aren't myths, but they're hell have happened, but like that you hear whatever the urban myths of like cops literally dropping off boxes of guns. In, in fucking, in, in really jacked right. up neighborhoods. Go nuts. Yeah, exactly, yeah. dude. Yeah, totally. And people are like, oh, I don't know. You're like, no, that happens. That like basically happened until like 10 years ago. Yeah. Right. <laughs> you know what I mean? Up until like the 90s and 2000s. Fred Hampton said, we'll work with anybody and form coalitions with anybody that has revolution on their mind. Yes. Another quote, uh, poor people of all descendants, they had them caught up in movements based on racism. When the Black Panther Party stood up and said that we don't care what anybody says, we're going to fight racism, not with racism, but we're going to fight it with solidarity. Exactly, dude. Uh, we're not going to fight fire with fire. We're going to fight fire with water. But the fastest way to change that was for those neighborhoods to come together. Housing issues, police brutality, just being fed up. That's what we could all agree on. A uh, quote from another member, uh, Mike Klonsky. If there was a protest or a demonstration, the word would get out and we would all come to it and support each other. If somebody was arrested, we would all raise bail. If somebody was killed or shot by the police, we would all respond together. Mm. Another quote from him, we believed in self-defense, but not provocation. Yes. 
So that's something I also believe in personally. Right. So basically the Panthers had the organization, the language and the know-how, and they took it to all these other groups via Fred Hampton mainly. Right. Uh, Hampton worked with them and helped establish survival programs in their communities. So mm. another thing like the, the breakfast programs and the clothing and all that stuff. Right. Um, so, Social nets. So uh, I'm going to link to a video about the Rainbow Coalition. And honestly, guys, if you look into one thing about the Panthers, check out this video because it's so fucking good. The powers that be did not like Fred Hampton. No, they did not. They were afraid he would become the messiah that they referred to in Co-Intel Pro documents. Right. And uh, it's a subsequent movie with a similar title that is going to be coming out here pretty soon that I just found out about. Really? Are you serious? No, I haven't. Dude, it's called Judas and the Black Messiah. Ooh, okay. Interesting. We should watch it right now. It literally <laughs> only takes two minutes. Okay. Dude. I'm so surprised. You Marcus and Drew thing. react to trailer. Oh, good call. Okay. <laughs> All right, everybody. I'm about to pull up a video on the YouTubes of a trailer of an up and coming movie this 2020, 2021 season called uh, Judas and the Black Messiah, starring the guy from Get Out. Oh, okay. Uh, I can't remember his name just because I suck at names. I'm mm -hmm. good at faces. He's um, a great actor. As well as, did you see any of the Black Mirror episodes? Uh, well, the guy who plays like the Kirk like character, the main, mm -hmm. uh, antagonist, I guess, and mm -hmm. also protagonist, I guess, um, <laughs> is also in it as like one of the co-intel pro, like, I'm going to flip you and turn you against your, your buddy. Lovely. Yes. So, all right. We're about to watch Judas and the Black Messiah. I'm throwing my money at the screen, but nothing is happening. <laughs> Shut up and take my money. <laughs> I don't see how that could be a bad movie. How was that, dude? <laughs> right? Oh, man. Yeah, that looks intense as F, huh? Oh, fuck. Dude. Good. That's yeah, no, amazing. He, he did a great job in kind of portraying mannerisms of uh, Fred Hampton. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's awesome. But it's, I'm when he said the Black glad. Judas or whatever. Uh, the Black Messiah. Judas, the, the Black, yeah. yeah, the Messiah. That kind of, that's, that's what fucked them. That, that, was, that was in the COINTELPRO documents. Literally I'm, I'm going to link to him. Yeah, I'm going to. Um, Motherfuckers. So these groups were also targeted and infiltrated by the Chicago PD's Red Squad. Why were they called the Red Squad? Because they were like supposed to go after like communist people. Ah, okay. But they were. I thought it had a more sinister colloquial meaning, but go ahead. No, as you could imagine, they were uh, pretty much pieces of shit. Yeah, probably. So, um, <laughs> as per was the time. All right. Did you read up on his robbery and assault charges? Negative. Fred Hamptons. Okay. The thing is, you have to be careful with any charges or anything that people got because of number one hardcore they, bias and straight up racism of course like mo <laughs> there's so many cases where black panthers were you know they were planted arrested drugs on them or planted yeah, guns or yeah whatever, and yeah and then they made up charges and then even even the juries at the time were like dude this is bullshit yeah yeah <laughs> like all white juries being like eh, yeah this no. is bullshit right well it's a jury of their peers though marcus right well <laughs> We'll talk about that. <laughs> so Fred Hampton was charged for robbery and assault over $71 worth of ice cream. <laughs> oh, man. What a t – oh, man. <laughs> Somebody put this monster away. What is this world coming to? Yeah. So that story I'm not going to get into. It's just – What year was that? Um, yeah. I didn't even write down the date because I was like, should I look into this? or should Well, I, I just wanted to know if it was, was like when he was a kid or if it was like – No, no, no. It was just... after he became the leader of the Illinois – Interesting. Blank okay. Yeah. Gotcha. That matters. Uh, he was released on bail – he also spoke at the conference for United Fronts Against Fascism, which was a thing uh, that happened in Oakland, I believe. It was nice. somewhere in California. Mm -hmm. And again, that was a, that was a multi-ethnic thing. He was named the spokesperson of the Black Panther Party. And shortly after that, there was some pretty terrible stuff that happened to him. So, so on December 4th, 1969, mm -hmm. at yes. around 4 a.m., uh, police burst into his apartment. They shot and killed a black, another Black Panther named Mark Clark. They right. wounded uh, several other Panthers. And they dragged Hampton out of the bed and shot him point blank in the back of the head twice. Hampton was 21. Clark was 22. Mm -hmm. 21, this, dude. Yeah. The state attorney tried to charge the survivors of the attack with attempted murder of the police. Right. Fred Hampton's death was ruled a justifiable homicide. Over 90 bullets were fired. 99, evidently. Yeah. And I've read that only one was from a panther. Yeah, I heard that too. So I heard that reports indicate that uh, a black a woman in the black pa in this like apartment or whatever who was mm -hmm. part of the Black Panthers fired first, fired one shot. Okay. Though, uh, evidently she was behind like two different doorways. Okay. And the physics are kind of uh, questionable, let's say. Sure. Because um, a lot of people who have uh, who are far more familiar with the logistics of uh, of the incident more than I am 
basically were saying that to the police's account of like, well, you know, we went up to the door and like opened it and it got shot at first or whatever. And so we returned fire and killed this or and shot this woman. She didn't have, it was impossible for her to to make that. Yes, exactly. is, Is what I'm getting at basically. Now, I also heard testimony from, I think it was like Fred Hampton's wife, I think, or it was like, you know, his was, wife was there. Yeah. Yeah. She was, was like nine months, eight, eight, nine months, probably fucking ready to pop, dude. Um, said that, um, the cops came in and finished her husband off basically and yeah. shot him and said, now he's good and dead or quoted something along those lines. Yep. I'm sorry. Not, not his wife, Hampton's fiance. When you said like they came in and they shot him for sh- like, you know, twice in the head, is that official or is that just what her eyewitness testimony has said? It's important to make a distinction. For sure. Though I'm sure we no, can all guess. There's, you, you can see, I'm going to post, uh, unfortunately, there's some pictures of like him. I like, saw the picture of the cops bringing out the body and the three yeah, smiling fucking yeah. shit eating. Oh, there's another picture of him like bleeding. Grin. There's another picture of him just in a pile of blood in mm-hmm. the hallway. Too, yeah, so. I saw the two um, mattresses or whatever that were like over on the top of him. They were just like a sponges for blood, dude. Yeah. It, was, it, was, it was not good, dude. Evidently, the shootout lasted like 12 minutes. Yeah. And um the lawyer I'm I'm pretty sure was um saying that the Panthers on three different occasions tried to call for a ceasefire. Yeah, jeez. And they were just like, "No, keep shooting." <sighs> so, yeah, I didn't get to research this part as much even though ironically this was like this the whole reason that I wanted to start this uh whole podcast, but um the scene was not sealed by the police. So the mm. public was given tours to see it for themselves. Are you kidding? Like into like an active crime scene? Like, yeah. yeah. Oh my god, dude! Just leaving evidence that and fucking disturbing evidence and yeah. f- oh my yeah. god, dude! That is like that's like cr- oh, I'm like speechless. That's yeah. like crime. Like one. That's like forensics 101, yeah. dude. Just I, locked like down I've, the scene, I've seen a picture where there's like a line of people waiting to go through. Who this would want to go see that anyway? Like. Jesus, like, dude. People might want to see it for different. Same type of that are smiling freaking while they're maybe, bringing the corpse Maybe out. that. There could be people who are just like, I, I need to see this for myself. I can't believe this happened. I could happened. see that. Yeah, yeah. Or good call. Like, half and know, half. Good or, call. Good Because the other thing that I'll, that I'll talk about is like different publications took different sides. Oh, no way. Like the Tribune, <laughs> for example, leaned heavily toward the law enforcement. Of course. Yeah. Um, people might be trying to actually parse out the truth for themselves. Totally. There was a no report, cohesion of narrative. Right. There was even a report from one of the Chicago papers that actually looked in and said that there was one of the shots that was supposed to be fired against the police was actually just a nail in the wall. Oh, I actually saw a bunch, like a bunch of those. A yeah. bunch of those were like, here's the, here's the different spots. Here's the nail on the wall. Yeah. Here's a nail on the wall. Here's a nail on the wall. Yeah. I mean, it's hard because when I was watching some of these like um, videos from, from back in the day, dude, the video is fucking shit, dude. It right. is terrible fucking video, dude. Right. It's so hard to see detail, mm-hmm. dude. So when these guys are pointing shit out, dude, like you can't it, tell from dude, the you can't tell anything, dude. Video. No, yeah. dude. Honestly, a lot of the wall looks like fucked up and decrepit too. Mm-hmm. Like it looks like the apartment that they were staying in was like super jacked up. To Probably kind of to was. Begin with. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and so it's hard to see like through. And I'm not trying to make excuses for anybody, dude. I'm mm-hmm. just I'm just trying to be real. When you're looking at like walls and door frames and shit, and they're like, "This is what you're seeing," and I'm like, "I don't know. Is that what I'm fucking seeing, dude?" Mm-hmm. Like regardless of what they're what they are actually saying, whether they're saying it's a nail or a fucking bullet hole, dude. I question all of it because uh, i mean there was one indication where you could like really zoom in where they were like here's the bullet hole that they say was the one that like got them to shoot first and it's clear as day a fucking nail dude mm-hmm. so if that's true if that is the thing that they were pointing out or whatever that's bullshit yeah so the only shot that was fired was from mark clark's shotgun uh into the ceiling he was the one behind the front door it's uh, it was rumored that the authorities were also going to do a raid on bobby seal's house later that night or whatever or mm-hmm. like later that like day um, but because of the like horrific, like, well, I, I guess I wouldn't call it failure because they did kill the motherfucker, but like, you know, because of the horrific, like, failure of the, of the, of the Hampton raid mm-hmm. that they called off the Bobby Seal one. Mm-hmm. I don't know how true that is, but if that's any, if, that, if there's any truth to that, Bobby Seal fucking thank his lucky stars after that. Yeah. I mean, I know a lot of people, I, I've read different accounts of like after different people got, uh, got axed, they would kind of go into hiding, you know, right. things like that. So. As you do. Uh, the People's Law Office filed a suit that got tied up in the courts. Uh, a series of appeals finally landed them an, an, a non-adversarial judge uh, who ordered the release of official documents. These files revealed that an FBI informant, William O'Neill, yeah. infiltrated the Illinois chapter. Yeah. He was known for inciting violence. Uh, reportedly, he tried to supply them with explosives and an electric chair. 
and wanted them to like use it against people. A lot of people think that was like one of the co-intel pros like first attempts to be like, try to catch these guys up mm -hmm. and some stuff, but it was just so like overtly ridiculous that the people were like, we're not going to do that. Why yeah. would we do that? Yeah. And then reportedly Fred Hampton didn't really want him in the organization, but, um, he needed security and needed like, yeah. you know, mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, O'Neill provided the authorities with the floor plan of the headquarters that doubled as Hampton's home. Right. Oh, I said it. I said it doubled as the headquarters. It didn't double as the headquarters. It was like a meeting place. It was close to the headquarters. And uh, in those floor plans, they featured a red X drawn over his bed. Yeah. Uh, evidently, um, a lot of reports said that the the uh, raid took place like literally while he was sleeping. Yeah, it was four four thirty four in the morning. morning yeah. And um, O'Neill was supposed to be in charge of security that night. Uh, the night before he had, uh, or earlier that night, I guess, he had drugged Fred before leaving the property. Really? Is that yeah. confirmed? That's in, that in the documents. Said? I haven't gotten to that part yet. No way. So. What happened to uh, O'Neill, Marcus? O'Neill got a $300 bonus. <laughs> so I guess uh, you could say that Fred Hampton's life was worth $300. Uh, well, I mean, $300 in 1970 is money, Marcus. That's, I mean, that's like, what, three fifty. So I, I know mean, you're trying to make a joke, I know, too, but I am. <laughs> respectfully shut the hell up. <laughs> I'm, trying, I totally, I'm trying to make levity. I know. Yeah. Please dude, tell we me sell what. ourselves for such, such short, you know, such cheap fucking, we, we cheapen ourselves, dude. Like, and, and it's really depressing. Yeah. And it takes many forms. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, yeah, you don't know what happened to that guy? No, please. So he went into the witness protection program for obvious fucking reasons. Sure. Um, gave a couple of interviews and then in like 92 or three or four, um, uh, fucking killed himself. Yeah. I'm not surprised. Yep. <sighs> uh, I don't know if he, uh, shot himself or hung himself like the real fucking Judas or whatever, but, uh, mm. I'm guaranteed that's the reason why. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, we get to act three now. In 1970, two years after his conviction and a lot of solitary confinement, uh, call back to the prisons episode, uh, Huey was acquitted. After two more mistrials, he was cleared of all charges. His release was celebrated, but things had changed. Huey said in his biography, Revolutionary Suicide, quote, Although people received me warmly, I was at first a symbol. Our relationship had changed. There was now an element of hero worship that had not existed before I got busted. The earlier close family tie had been enlarged by an image of me created through publicity and the media. So much had been written, so much said, that I was distanced from them, and there was slight estrangement. So on top of this, the FBI's targeting had successfully developed fissures in the group, not just by exhausting its leaders with legal issues, or sometimes yeah, you know, like wearing, murder. Yeah, wearing them down. Yeah, and disagreements between and within chapters over money had also occurred. There was also a public dispute between Huey P. Newton and Eldridge Cleaver in 71 that led to Eldridge leaving the party and that also kind of fractured the party because people would take sides. Of course, as you do. And according to Donald L. Cox, there were also some power politics being played by David Hilliard and publicity had changed Huey, which is kind of sort of what he alluded to uh, hmm. himself. He basically got like too, uh, too mainstream, too freaking, uh, too corporate. It wasn't about the music anymore, man. man. Yeah. So, uh, in 71, Bobby's conviction was overturned for that whole uh, Chicago 8 thing. Right. Uh, in 73, Newton wrote uh, Revolutionary Suicide. In 74, with accusations thrown of a murder and an assault, um, there may have been some fuckery with the witnesses, but that's yet another rabbit hole. Uh, Newton fled to Cuba mm -hmm. as he didn't mm -hmm. think he would get a fair trial. Right. Uh, he returned three years later thinking perhaps the climate had changed. Uh, the murder case against him was dismissed after two deadlocked juries. And the assault case fizzled out when the victim changed his testimony. Nice. Fun fact, uh, Jim Jones, you know, the Jonestown guy? <laughs> yeah, the Kool-Aid enthusiast. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> he, uh, he visited Huey when he was in Cuba. Um, random? Yeah. Uh, I guess uh, well, Huey Well, actually had not random because he was actually uh, – Jim Jones was actually really big into like uh, a whole similar kind of rainbow coalition – of creating, um, it was just a coalition of, of, of everybody of uh, all walks of life or whatever to, and a kind of pseudo socialist, pseudo Marxist kind of, um, pepper on it. I didn't know that. Yeah. Um, cause Newton, Newton had a cousin who was actually in Jim's cult and luckily he was, really? he was one of the few that escaped Jonestown. I did not know that. Mm -hmm. Cause yeah, Jim, jo uh, Jonestown was, uh, Jim Jones's, um, cult. Uh, it didn't start off here, but it got, really got its legs in, uh, San Francisco. Right. Which obviously is right across the street from Oakland, basically. Yeah. So let's get into the epilogue here. I don't know if I'm going to put that same uh, happy, cheery music because some of these songs aren't great, but uh, it could be kind of sad, like that, uh, like that uh, music with like the you know like uh, infected eyed like dog that's just like for, for only four dollars your donation can go to this poor tiny little dog with this 
really puffy, gross eye thing going on here. <laughs> All right, stop. We're going to get sued. I'm that one chick. In 1971, uh, Huey took a trip to China, where he was embraced by the people and representatives of many communist socialist nations. Were they, was he really? Mm-hmm. That's weird because yeah, the like Chinese to... are fucking crazy fucking racist. Yeah, they're taking it. Yeah, yeah. I thought that was weird too. Huh. Drew, it's okay. He one of us. Yeah. Drew, have you ever heard of the uh, Citizens Commission to investigate the FBI? No. No, but it sounds like it something It does cool. sound something I could get behind. So in 1971, uh, William C. Davidon and seven others broke into an FBI field office. Cool. Uh, and stole a bunch of files, cool. including documents on Cointel Pro. Nice. The burglars' identities were unknown until 2014. Damn. Yeah. Good if job, guys. Yeah. So if you're interested, uh, there's a book called The Burglary, and there's a documentary based on that book called 1971. Awesome. So that kind of led, in part, to the church committee. Um, ah. So in 1975, the church committee, as we've talked about before. In our MK Ultra episode. In a few of them. Um, oh, also in the Assassinations episode. Yeah. It's all over. <laughs> The church committee hearings blew the lid on the FBI's operations against the, Pan- against the Panthers and other organizations. And again, I've linked the report. Wait, not again. That's a different report. This is a different. This is a good government report. So many reports. So, <laughs> yeah, I, I've linked the uh, church committee uh, documents. That's what you read. get here at Face to Face. A shit ton of information. <laughs> Just red eyes. <laughs> Quote from there. Many of the techniques used would be intolerable in a democratic society, even if all the targets had been involved in violent activity. Right. But Co Intel Pro went far beyond that. The Bureau conducted a sophisticated vigilante operation aimed squarely at preventing the exercise of First Amendment rights of speech and association. At least. (laughs) This is from a Senate committee, y'all. That's just for flavor. Right. They did Um, way more fucking deeper shit. In 1980, Huey received his PhD in social philosophy from UC Santa Cruz. Nice. So he became a doctor. Nice. Dr. Huey. Dr. Huey. So uh, people who supported the Panthers for reasons such as political representation, social programs, ending the war largely... Uh, and employment opportunities got some of what they wanted and more changes in policing policy and law followed. So mm-hmm, of course. by giving into some of these demands, the powers that be found a more effective weapon than killing and jailing people. Imagine that just giving people what they want. Right. Totally. Kind of makes them less angry. Yeah. You know what I mean? Meeting them halfway is so weird. Yeah. It's so weird. Like meeting people halfway, if I can get you so far, who, 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 who to thunk? Who to thunk. Yeah. yeah. So this is where I kind of jump around a little bit. But just to kind of stick with the story. So in 1982, uh, the Panthers dissolved. This is kind of a rabbit hole. I'm not sure I want to go into, but I'll just explain it. So uh, in the aftermath of them, the Crips rose to power. And, of course, the crack epidemic just completely fucked up the black community. Mm-hmm. Uh, if anybody's interested in this, you can check out the documentary uh, Bastard Children of the Black Panthers, which is about the Crips. Nice. And if people are also interested about the crack epidemic, you should also check out the book called, I think, Dark Alliance by Gary Webb who was a uh, whistleblower that basically authored that book that um, posted a bunch of stuff about uh, the CIA's involvement with running um, cocaine Mm. into LA. Mm. And it's not like conspiracy theory shit. That's like declassified real shit, dude. Freeway, Ricky, Ricky Ross and all that. Right. After a grueling legal battle, Fred Hampton and Marx Clark's family successfully sued the city of Chicago and the state's attorney's office. You said the shitty of Chicago. I'm not even going to correct you. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> in uh, in 85, Huey was arrested for embezzling, presumably to support a developing cocaine habit. Well, I mean, you know, cocaine's a hell of a drug. <laughs> That's what I hear. In, in 1987, uh, this one's actually cool. In 1987, Bobby wrote a cookbook called Barbecuing with Bobby. Eh, awesome. Yeah. Uh, Here's my recipe for pulled pork. <laughs> I bet it's fucking delicious. Oakland, <laughs> Oakland Black Panther barbecue. Right, dude? Huh? Right. Bomb. Done, right? For real. Uh, Eldridge Cleaver would later have a change of heart. Uh, he returned to the U.S. in 75. He found a few different faiths. He supported Re- Reagan and denounced communism. He hmm. also fell into cocaine and died in 98. So that's kind of what I was saying about, like, I wish I would have gotten a chance to see. Right. Fred I was going to mention that. Yeah. Uh, you know, freaking beliefs or whatever. If he would have got a chance to actually, like, you know, think on him and develop him as he grew. Oh, fuck. In he life. was 21, that's dude. What I mean, dude. Like, we all had, like, our opinions when we were at 21. We're all that, like, fiery, like, yeah, that's what needs to happen and stuff. But I mean, wisdom kind of comes with like a lot of experience and you kind of yeah kind you can of see how your, russia and china would have developed and then for maybe, real maybe reconsidered but some like of you things. still would have been like had your core beliefs intact or whatever maybe mm-hmm. just the you know the method would yeah, have the changed. actual practice right exactly yeah. and that's actually why i really really like fred hampton is his charisma is fucking off the chain dude yeah. his beliefs and stuff come from a good place they mm-hmm. come from a place of genuine need yeah. and desire we needed to fix those pro- and a lot of them still need to be fucking fixed by yeah. the way but like those those issues needed attention, dude. And like, 
if all that they were, if the only, if they were only going to get attention based on his like view of this les, lens of um, socialism and Mar- and Marxism, hey man, you got to start somewhere, so bro. Be it, man. You yeah. fucking a dude. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, hey, like it's not the end all be all. He's just trying to make a suggestion of something. You know yeah. what I mean? We can always tweak it later, dude. Like, right. In 1989, Huey was convicted of embezzling and was murdered by a gang member in Oakland on the very streets that he. Uh, yeah was trying to counter so um in order to i think a, by a crip right uh no he was uh, um, a member of the black gorilla family oh yeah and he he did it oh, in then. order he did it in order to rise in the ranks yeah yeah uh, which is weird because it's like bro you're just gonna piss off literally everybody you're not gonna rise in any ranks you're just gonna be you're gonna rise to the top of the rank of the shit list of everybody in the fucking neighborhood yeah uh, police said it was an argument over a drug deal. The guy who killed him said Huey had a gun, but there's no evidence. There's no evidence that Huey had a gun, and mm-hmm. witnesses kind of discredit uh, the, R- Robinson, who's the murderer. His right, account. his accounts of him having a gun. So yeah. he said he's a. Who knows exactly? Lame. In 1997, uh, Geronimo Pratt, which is uh, Tupac's godfather that I mentioned, right. he was released under new evidence. He won a wrongful imprisonment case. Uh, which included 2.75 million from the city of LA and 1.75 million from the FBI. Damn. So good for Adam him. Boy. Least, I mean, Fuck it yeah. doesn't, he doesn't get his fucking 20 years of his life back. But yeah. Well, I mean, you know, and you know, well, that's obviously worth way more than like, what right. is that? Three and a half million or whatever yeah. it is or whatever. Yeah. Well, after the lawyer's fees, what is that? Like a million and a half? <laughs> like, you know, let's be real. And after taxes, what right. is that? Like 75,000 for the fuck, or 750,000 rather? Like, so. uh, here's a Coke. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we can tell him to have a Coke in his mouth and shut the fuck up. <laughs> This is a good one. Uh, in 2019, Bobby lived to see the 50th anniversary of his trial as one of the Chicago Eight. Nice, dude. Bobby Seale is the only major Panther Party. Who's still fucking... Uh, founder, yeah. Who's still, still alive, dude. Which, if I knew nothing about anything, just knowing that would make me suspicious. <laughs> <laughs> what deal did he make? All right. So, this part, let's go into the conspiracy realm, because I mm-hmm. haven't been able to substantiate this stuff. Okay. But put if, my it's hat true, on that. if it's true, this shit is crazy. This is the part in the movie where, like... You get revealed of what was going on the whole time. Maybe you got little hints of it. The after the credits roll, and then there's like another scene. You're like, oh. It turns the whole thing upside down. Totally. So uh, there's a guy named Richard Aoki. He's, uh, I believe, he's Japanese. Sounds and, sounds sounds Japanese. Right. So he was a guy that Bobby Seal refers to um, in Seize the Time. Um, he actually supplied them with some of their first weapons. Yeah, I wish I got more time to write all this stuff down because I'm just going to spit it off the cuff. Lay, lay it on me, dog. So, yeah, he gave he gave the Panthers some of their first weapons, and he was kind of, like, there throughout those kind of instrumental times. And there's some evidence that came out kind of recently that said Aoki was actually working as an informant himself, too. Well, it wouldn't surprise me. I mean, a lot of these people that kind of get involved, whether they're selling drugs or guns or, like, even security or whatever, if there's a need that this group has the infiltrating party wants to fill that need. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? And the best way to do that is through illegal means. So if people are buying, cause nobody asks fucking a lot of questions and stuff. And if somebody has like a shady past, like, Oh, well, that makes sense. He just sold me a bunch of guns. Right. You know what I mean? So it's, it's, you know, criminals don't really ask a lot of questions when they t- start and do that type of shit. And so sure. it's lame because then that's how, uh, yeah, that's, that's how, uh, that's how termites get in. Mm-hmm. So let's get to the conclusion. Um, you know, why was the government so scared? Yeah, that's, I think the, if you don't take anything away, dear listener, from this entire thing, that's kind of what I think is like the key underlining point is that they killed this dude on purpose when he was only 21, dude. So that to me, even if I knew nothing about the situation and the granule fucking logistics of everything, that would scream as a red flag to me that is saying like that, that the authorities were terrified of this mm-hmm. dude they knew about this dude they knew about this dude's potential and they were half none of it dude yeah uh this you know the black panthers was an organization that lifted up cared for protected educated and advocated for oppressed people mm-hmm. so kill them yeah right. uh, so that's probably the best way to do is to get rid of it is to counter that narrative with force yeah they want it's it's a self-fulfilling prophecy you fools like again you short-sighted idiots like if you were to counter that narrative with like peace and like understanding and maybe meeting them halfway and, you know, maybe even like ridiculing them a little bit or whatever, because if that's not, if that's something you don't want or whatever, obviously you're not going to be for it or whatever. Mm. But if you, if you become the very thing that they say that they're fighting against, right. you're, you know what I mean? You're just, yeah. you're just, you're just being like making them go like, yeah, look, like, look what they do. Look what they're doing. See, and that's what gets to me is I think about like, if I were a person around in this time, what would I be thinking? Right. What would be influencing my thoughts? 
You know, I'd be seeing these people that. Well, again, that Marcus, I, if you weren't connected and you didn't have like your f- finger on the pulse or whatever, you might buy into the narrative that the. But Tribune, there wasn't even there wasn't that, even an alternative media really back then. No, but there were at least co in cohesion of a narrative. Okay. There were different right. people saying different exactly. things about this. Yeah. So again, if if you didn't have if you weren't like connected about some of these things and weren't at least at least seeking you know, to try to find information about that stuff at that time, you might would just come to, you know, especially in like the sixties, dude, right. where, where this is before we all knew of, about fake news right. and we all knew about the, um, well, this is in the background of like Vietnam and like Watergate. Right. And, like, exactly. You, you know, don't know, we trust. don't know yet about the agendas of some of these companies and right. corporations yeah. and stuff like that, the political agendas, the social agendas. And so for, you know, if, and if you didn't know about anything, so you could just, you could just be sitting there and you'd read the freaking, uh, the tribune or whatever saying like, ah, oh, Look at all these, uh, the, uh, you know, uppity dangerous Negroes freaking taken up and different, you know, and, and right. the cops are lucky to be alive and right. they just, by the grace of God, they didn't fucking die and all this like fucking rhetoric that we heard or whatever from these guys saying yeah. and not really have known of like, dude, you know that they shot like 99 bullets into the building? Do you know that it went on for 12 minutes? Do you know that like, so, you know what I mean? Yeah. So where it kind of, you start going like, wait a minute, that's destroying the narrative that I just read in this other paper. You yeah. know what I mean? And it's hilarious. I was, I was watching fucking King of the Hill the other day and it was hilarious watching him, watching Hank. Um, see something on the news and being like, oh, they are, li- I don't believe this. They are lying on the news. <laughs> it is just hilarious to me or whatever of that, like, that, like, era that we used to, like, all live in of, like, that trusting, like, well, I mean, we can agree with that, the new, whatever the news says, that's a, that's a, that's an era of legitimacy that we can all agree on. Yeah. And yeah. it's just like, it couldn't be further from the truth. Yeah. And I mean, they were, they were called gangs and even like the, the, the self defense that had to be violent and, you know, bullshit arrests that would poison their images in the eyes of, in the eyes of Absolutely. You know, the general public. Absolutely. PR is everything, dude. If yeah. they see them being like, arrested, and, exactly. It's all optics, dude. I have a whole bunch of points in here that I just threw in in the epilogue to like maybe if we were we talking it about it. Yeah, 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 sure. So Cha Cha Jimenez uh, was awesome name. The, yeah, that's uh, a fake name. Well, his name is Jose. His nickname is Cha Cha. Okay, but, that but makes people sense. call him Cha Cha. Totally. He was the leader of the uh, the Young Lords, part of the Rainbow Coalition. He said, uh, "Police were harder on us when we were in when we were political than when we were a gang." They were. They put us in the same hole. They were afraid we'd organize the rest of the jail population. Yeah, exactly, dude. It, they came down harder on them because they knew they were more of a threat. If yeah. you're just a gang running around breaking windows and drinking forties and fucking like <laughs> fucking with people in private property and stuff. Well, like they that. were a gang because like there was violent, you know, racist lines, like segregated lines, because they they had to like they they had to break into places, be rowdy and stuff to say that hey, we have a right to fucking be here. Well, I mean, before the political like, aspect or whatever, yeah. it's, it's, it's funny to me that like they said that they were like they made that realization of like, dude, like when we were just like fucking around. They hardly fucked with us. As soon as we right. became political, they're like, "Now okay, we're no scared, more f- and we got to exactly, we gotta bro, exactly." Down. Which is funny because they're like, "So you're saying like you're kind of going to let us fuck around and do all this other like maybe semi destructive shit?" But as soon as we start doing something that's like positive and constructive or whatever, you're going to come down on us harder. Okay, I see how it is. Yeah, yeah. Uh, a quote here from Reverend Ralph David Abernathy of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference at Hampton's funeral. He said, if the United States is successful in its drive to crush the Black Panther Party, it won't be long before it seeks to crush your party. Straight up, dude. Yeah. That's what happens to every, like, civilization, dude, when it, when it, when it conquers and just wins or whatever in foreign areas, it brings that shit home and starts looking inward and being like, you're not this enough or that enough. You know what I mean? That's why the Nazi movement would have fundamentally petered out anyway. I mean, after a lot more deaths, but like, yeah. if they would have like won, quote unquote, and then like conquered whatever the fuck, they would have turned inward, dude. They would have been like, mm. you know, you're not Nazi enough. You're not blonde enough. So and so, I heard his mother was a quarter fucking gypsy or something yeah. so you know Just what i mean crazy it'll never be enough dude there's mm. no there's there's no level like of uh patriotism or whatever that you could that one could uh you know because there's no there's not like a, a purity that's like reachable you know what i mean right for sure you know what's interesting too is like the bureaucrats shut down their survival programs with bullshit bureaucracy like oh you know uh, there was one guy who was quoted saying like, oh, the fucking, the, the ceiling's too high and the floor is too low or whatever the hell. Like bullshit, like building codes type of crap. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. But they yeah. wouldn't use those same codes to look at like all the fucking places that the Somebody people else. were living in. Yes, of course. You know yeah, yeah, I mean? yeah. The, the, the terrible like living conditions or whatever. Yeah, and the yeah. projects or whatever. Yeah. yeah. I should mention that, you know, the Panthers weren't angels, kind of like we sort of touched on a little bit. You know, there were, there was histories of petty crimes and like I said, embezzling happened and, uh, Eldridge Cleaver has a pretty dark past as well. Yeah, um, a lot of that stuff didn't really help their image. For which sure. Which, if, uh, if, if they had, like, a better PR person, they could have maybe cleaned up a lot of that shit better. 
Yeah, but I mean, in some cases, it kind of served those people well because they got an inside taste of the system. They're like, well, wait a yeah. minute. Why is it that I feel like I'm necessitated right. to these things? Totally. So Yeah, it's true. First-hand experience really fucking motivates people way or, more than, you know, yeah. second-hand experience. Especially if they're, you know, lost teenagers, disenfranchised. Oh, and, totally. Just aching for, like, some kind of uh, direction and yeah. leadership. And, yeah, absolutely. That's and, a uh, cultural problem we're having right now in America. For actually. sure. For sure. For some uh, points against the Panthers, look into the case of Eugene Leroy Anderson and uh, Betty Van Patter. Where have I heard that name before? Uh, Eugene Anderson was a suspected informant. I don't know if it, if it's proven that he actually was. Bad things happened to him. And Betty Van Patter was a, a bookkeeper, and she was like saying, "Hey, some of the some of these numbers don't add up and everything." And she turned up dead. They haven't really linked him to the Panthers. There's no hard evidence, but worst case of suicide you ever seen. Two shots know. to the back of the head? I'm not sure. That's just one of those holes. Uh, according to Dr. Curtis Austin, uh, 73% of the newspaper articles written on the Panthers were written by the FBI or people that they've recruited, which isn't really that hard to believe. I mean, 73% is a fucking giant number. That's but, a pretty good size majority. Yeah. But, I mean, you got to understand, like you were saying, there was another thing where they had anybody of any cultural significance. They were in bed with them. Oh, totally. Remember? I forget what the name of that uh, operation was, but um, was it Mockingbird? <clears throat> Intelligence community embedded themselves into the um, into like news and stuff, yeah. and like would pay news anchors to, mm -hmm. to straight up run CIA fucking propaganda. Right? Yes, right. that's yeah. Mockingbird, like that type of thing. Well, that stopped back in the seventies, obviously, Mark, because that's the Churchill oh, meetings told us all right, that. Right, yeah, right, exactly. Right, yeah. So uh, I'm going to quote from the forward of Seize the Time. Uh, this book shows the chronological development of our party and how it grew out of how it grew out of the social evils of an unjust, oppressive system. It also shows that repression is a natural product of this wealthy technological society, owned and controlled by a small minority of the people. The life and existence of the Black Panther Party is the ideology of the party in motion, is a biography of oppressed America, black and white, that no news report, TV documentary, book, or magazine has yet expressed. To do so, the media would let the people know what's really going on how things have happened, and how we're struggling for our freedom. So, as I mentioned earlier, there's the 10-point program, and this is kind of their founding uh, ideologies. Uh, and I'm going to go ahead and just read some of those for you guys in one of these tabs that I have open. <laughs> Don't hate me. Not at all, dude. Freaking <laughs> dude, 30 of these are Black Panthers. Okay? Yeah, we like freaking least, information so. here at uh, Face to Face. So the way it's supposed to be read, there's a list of uh, 10 wants and then 10 beliefs, and they're supposed to be read, according to Bobby, this is how they should be read. This is the original version. We want freedom. We want power to determine the destiny of our black community. We believe that black people will not be free until we're able to determine our destiny. We want full employment for our people. We believe that the federal government is responsible and obligated to give every man employment or guaranteed income. Hmm. We believe that if the white American businessman, which was later changed to capital, it's something like See, that. See, right there, like, I'm, uh, you can restart that again if you want, but like right there, that's, that's what I'm talking about. The government is supposed to guarantee you a job and a, and a, and a wage. Right. That type of shit is going to drive away fucking like business and capital. Anyway, right. sorry. Start no, over again. No, sorry. Sure. I apologize. Uh, we believe that the federal government is responsible and obligated to give every man uh, employment or a guaranteed income. Hmm. We believe that if the white American businessman will not give full employment, then the means of production should be taken from the businessman and placed in the community so people of the community can organize and employ all of its people and give a high standard of living. Hmm. We want an end to the robbery by the capitalists of our black community. We believe that this racist government has robbed us, and now we're demanding the overdue debt of 40 acres and two mules. 40 acres and two mules were promised 100 years ago as restitution for slave labor Word. and the mass murder of black people. We will accept the payment in currency, which will be distributed to our many communities. So reparations. Right. The Germans are now aiding the Jews in Israel for the genocide of the Jewish people. The Germans murdered 6 million Jews. The American racist has taken part in the slaughter of over 50 million black people. Therefore, we feel this is a modest demand that we make. Damn. We want decent housing fit for the shelter of human beings. We believe that if the white landlords will not give decent housing to our black community, then the housing and land should be made into co-op cooperative so that our community with government aid can build and make decent housing for its people. We want education for our people that exposes the true nature of this decadent American society. We want education that teaches our true history and our role in the present day society. We believe in an educational system that will give to our people knowledge, give our people a knowledge of self. If a man does not have knowledge of himself and his position in society in the world, then he has little chance to relate to anything else. That's fucking 100% true. 
We want all black men to be exempt from military service. We believe that black people should be should not be forced to fight in the military to service to defend a racist government that does not protect us. We will not fight and kill other people of color in the world who, like black people, are victimized by the white racist government of America. But what if they give all? What if they get all the other shit? Then are they going to join the military? I would think. I would assume so. Right. Okay. This is the original version. Right. Right. No. Of um, course. <laughs> It's just a draft. This is the first, first time. This is the first time I'm hearing this. I'm just, okay. I'm just, I'm just reacting. <laughs> no, I knew you. I knew you'd have some uh, responses to some of these things. I do too. We will protect ourselves from the force and violence of the racist police and the racist military by whatever means necessary. Totally. We want an immediate end to police brutality and the murder of black people. We believe we can end police brutality in our black community by organizing black self defense groups that are dedicated to defending our black community from racist police Straight oppression up and brutality. Now tell me, dude. The Second Amendment to the Constitution of the United States gives a right to bear arms. We therefore believe that all black people should arm themselves for self-defense. Yep. We want freedom for all black men held, held in federal, state, county, and city prisons and jails. Damn, we believe, all of them, huh? Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> I don't care. A lot of comments. Starting that over again. Yeah. We believe that all black people should be released from the many jails and prisons because they've not received a fair and impartial trial. Yeah. I mean, I could totally fucking right. see the I, I had the same reaction to the first dude. one. I was like, oh, okay, well, if they didn't get a fair trial, then yeah, I get it. I get it. Yeah, totally. That's a hilarious scene in like, um, I, actually, I don't even remember fucking what movie it was or whatever, where like this brother's going to jail and he's like, you've been convicted by a jury of your peers. And he looks over and it's just all a bunch of fucking white He's <laughs> just like, mm, not really. Interesting you should say that. We want all black people when brought to trial to be tried in court by a jury of their peer group or people from their black communities as defined by the constitution of the united states Duh. we believe that court should follow the united states constitution so that black people receive fair trials Duh. the 14th amendment of the u.s constitution gives a man the right to be tried by his peer group a peer is a person from a similar economic social religious geographical environmental historical or racial background to do this the court will be forced to select a jury from the black community from which the black defendant came We've been and are being tried by all white juries that have no understanding of the average reason, quote, average reasoning man of the black community. See, the problem, the, 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 the sneaky thing in there is the or. So mm -hmm. you have all those different things or this other thing. So it's like, you know, cultural or racial or like, you know, like, so if they just fill one of them, then the, you know, the courts are like, well, this is one of your peers, dude. You're like, well, it should fucking fit all of them, right? Like, I'm sorry. It's not or, it's an and. Oh, I fucked well, that up. Yeah, you did. Sorry. Yeah, you just destroyed my entire point right there. Okay, well, actually, that makes more sense. Actually, that's okay. actually if I would have written it, I would have put and also because it's like mm, you should follow, you should try to fulfill in, most in of these. the time he like he talk, he talks about when they wrote this down, like as what they said as they were writing it. So well, yeah, I imagine it was like a founding fathers esque kind of a thing where they're all sitting there kind of pontificating on what the best way to proceed is and why certain things are maybe flawed and why other things maybe aren't. This was written in Richard Aoki's apartment. That guy that I mentioned who might who might have been an informant. Interesting. We want land, bread, housing, education, clothing, justice, and peace. When well, everybody wants that. Now you'll love this part. Unless you're, um, uh, what's that thing we can't eat bread? Gluten free. That's the one. Like celiac. <laughs> See, they weren't really ahead of their times with the whole diet thing or whatever. They need to rewrite. This. So underneath the belief for this one, it says, "When in the course of human events it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bands which have connected them with another, and to assume among the powers of the earth the separate and equal station to which the laws of nature and nature's God entitle them, a decent respect of the opinions of mankind requires that they should declare the causes which impel them to the separation." Which yeah, you might recognize. Mic drop, dude. Yeah, it sounds kind of. That sounds like it's. Plucked from the Constitution, It's basically. from the Declaration. Or Declaration of Independence, rather. Mm -hmm. Sorry. So, just for posterity, the 10 points were later amended. They combined the incarceration and trial points. They replaced the military service with the demand for health care. And they added a point about war. What is it good for? Right. Sorry. Absolutely oh, nothing. Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I said war. So, I mean, yeah, what can we learn from the Panthers and oh what happened God. to them? All kinds of good shit. And I know I've said this before, but if you create a structure challenging movement you expect to be infiltrated and if the government wants you they'll get you but you know what as as hampton said you can kill a revolutionary but you can't kill a revolution what i take away from it is their strength and unity totally solidarity yeah yeah and really we all want the same things dude so it'd be a good idea to maybe stop looking especially now dude with all this political fucking strife going on mm. it'd be a good idea to take a page from Hampton's book in the sense of trying to see each other as at, at worst misunderstood. Right. Because right now I feel like we see each other at worst right now as like basically evil. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Uh, a, a cancer that needs to be extinguished. Yeah. You know what I mean? And everything will just get better if this other side fucks off. And it's like, that's not how it works in society, dude. You can't just 
shun an entire group of people, dude, even if it's like a small group or whatever. If they're part of our society, dog, then we need to reach out. Extend that, a that, hand. Yeah, extend a hand. Extend an olive branch and be like, you know what, dude? I'm, I'm sorry. Like, I'm sorry. for uh, This is how I feel with all this political shit going on right now. And we need some solidarity. And I'm really afraid we're not going to get it, dude, because... I feel like we're kind There's of forces that are just driving us further and further that apart. Too, but we've all, that a hundred percent, a hundred percent, especially in the media and fucking social media and all mm-hmm. that shit, dude, and everything, um, constantly. But also because I feel like we've kind of reached an impasse as a society here in the United States where we are going to have to go through a turbulent process. And it's kind of, it's like a boulder that has now gone up to the very top of the mountain and has just started to fucking to go crest. Up, to crest, dude. You cannot stop that, dude. It's you will destroy yourself if you throw yourself in front of this fucking thing. I feel mm. like it's just a thing that we have to kind of get through. Now, how bad is it going to be? That's up to us. Yeah, for sure. But ultimately. I feel like we have to go through some kind of. Uh, I don't really care that much about what the other person wants anymore, as far as make wanting to make sure that I that they don't get that. Not that I want nine eleven to happen, but people rallied the hell behind bush dude it was it was the same with uh fucking covid for a half a second dude. yeah we, yeah for a ha- that was a really like good that, half dude. a second it was a fucking beautiful half second yeah. man we have it was all this rhetoric about like hey man we're all in this together and i really fucking believe that shit dude yeah. like i felt like fucking like hey dude even of all my like political buddies that i'm like i could not fucking because like, a virus is impartial it doesn't, doesn't give it doesn't two give shits a, dude it doesn't we're discriminate beings, between bro yeah. yeah exactly dude and and this is the other thing, too. I never got the chance to tell you this, dude. But, like, it bothers me that we forget, dude, because we, strat- we stratify each other and we fucking become uh, sectioned off or whatever in these dumbass little groups and stuff mm-hmm. like that. That we forget, bro, that we're all Americans, dude. Yeah. We're all fucking basically pretty much pulling in the same direction, dude. Yeah. How come we don't think of each other like that, dude? How come mm. people have these other identities first, bro? Oh, well, I'm this or I'm that or I'm, you know, and I'm not saying everybody does this, but if somebody's like, oh, I'm like white or I'm black or I'm fucking, I'm Mexican. I mean, you I'm should be proud of your culture, but I agree no, with what you're saying. No, agree. A hundred percent. You should be proud of your culture, even if you're white. Um, and <laughs> 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 that's allowed. It's fine. But yeah, but I don't, I, I just, I feel like we should have this like, kind of solidarity where we're like, well, we're American first and like, you know, like, and don't get me wrong. You should like carry that shit. Don't lose your cultural like identity. Sure. Just blend it in with what the shit that we got it's here. Supposed to be a melting pot. Yeah, dude. Like that's totally fine. Like I I think that's what like gives America its spice. I think that's why we're fucking better than other countries. Mm. And a lot of and it's funny that Hotep Jesus dude, or maybe it was Colin Noir or one of those fucking guys fucking or or maybe it was even fucking that leader of the Proud Boys dude fucking um Enrique Intario. But he had a shirt that said fucking American supremacist, and it's supposed to be like kind of like what the fuck does that mean right? oh okay american supremacist, supremacist. yeah because yeah, he's okay. like america is better fuck you like <laughs> like granted i wouldn't say it like that but <laughs> i get what he means he's like bro this fact that we like have a melting pot of like cultures with like a framework of like freedom and individuality fucking kind of you know grafted over it he's like bro you're not gonna find that anywhere else dude mm. and he's like that's super awesome dude like it's like i think the strongest culture is one that is accepting of other cultures that mm. kind of feeds it. That kind of otherwise like a, you just have inbreeding and like that's not even good for the gene pool. That's oh god! Like how many generations can you do with that? Like what? Like <laughs> two or three before you start having some like weird flipper children and shit? Like that's not going to last. Like come on! Like we all know that. That's how we got the X Men. You want that? <laughs> Wait a minute! The X Men are awesome. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, what can we take from this? I think you're right, dude. Solidarity, self determination, self respect. All power to the people. All power to the people. Do you enjoy the show and want to help it grow? Don't hesitate. Like, share, and donate. Like your left brain's the guy that actually has to do the work, and your right brain's just like writing all these ideas. Like, He's the conceptual dude, like, one. Why yeah. don't we just why, why don't we can't just you make just a car that, that runs on water? Yeah, man? exactly. Well, the the, 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 the left understand. brain's the logistics dude. That's just like, bro. <sighs> Fucking that would actually be a great skit of like two people that are like living their roommates and one this is like an eccentric like artist and the other one who's just like a fucking you know mm-hmm. like fucking numbers like and just like you know but up but up but up but up but up but up awesome uh in addition to thanksgiving though we're also coming up on the um anniversary of the fred hampton's death oh shit we are december 4th mm. yep just in a couple of days, basically. Yeah. Damn. 
Synergy, dog. You've been having kind of good luck with that on these last couple of episodes. Yeah, yeah. if I can edit it fast enough. Yeah, that's true. That's right. You can get it out by December 4th, bro. That's fucking... Oh, shit. When is that? <laughs> How many days would you... <coughs> that's oh, you're good. You have like... Yeah, you have like a solid week. Just work on just that one. <laughs> just, just what do you do mean just that one? one? It's four hours. <laughs> what do you mean just that one? God. Excuse me. Any other final thoughts or anything as we didn't get to? Um, Take care of yourselves and each other. And each other. Oh, you piece of shit, dude. Well done. Good job. <laughs> Jerry, Jerry. Do you know how that guy kind of came to prominence? I actually he did. Helped, like, he I did hear political this story. Office. That's right. Yeah. In, in Chicago. Right, right, right. In Chicago. Do you know what he got busted for? I'm pretty sure. Allegedly. Paying a prostitute with a check. Oh my god! <laughs> oh, dude. So he got busted. Why dude. would you? Oh. It was the eighties, dog. Fucking checks were like a new check. thing, and you know, like, I, I have the no check. actually evidence to back that up, but it just seems to me being like a fucking gen- generation, fucking millennial. That seems like a, a reasonable fucking explanation. Yeah, yeah. And then he got his fucking Jerry Springer show and and broke fucking broke broke right. records, and yeah. the rest is history. Yeah. You know what I think? I think uh, that we need to give. Jerry Springer, South Park, and Eminem credit for like really bringing the '90s, like just taking, really into pushing the envelope of broadcast. Oh, and Howard Stern. I was just about to say that, dude. Yeah. How could you? How dare you? Like, right, right. So we need. Yeah, they push the envelope, and you know, and only one of those people are scumbags. <laughs> Can you find which one? Yeah, vote now. <laughs> Um, you know what else is interesting? Text scumbag to face. <laughs> well, the other thing is too, I didn't write any, I think I wrote one joke in here. So oh, that's funny because when I'm doing anything. mine, I'll put like a little thing off to the side to be like, Hey, like riff on this real quick. Yeah, you know what I mean? Yeah. And if anything good comes with it, cool. Use it. Not no big deal. All right. All right. Cool. No worries. I, I do that when I'm writing, but mm-hmm. I mean, I do if they come to me. Right, right, right. They, right, they right, didn't right, really right. come but, to me in this did. episode. Well, it's probably some depressing shit, so. <laughs> yeah. As is, you know, pretty par for the course. But if you got anything, you know, just swing for the fences. I'll try it. I'll do my best. Yeah. I'll pull out my best dick jokes. <laughs> <laughs> Next thing I know, Drew comes up with some racist fucking shit joke. I'm like, dude! <laughs> That's why it was hilarious when, like, your buddy was trying to be, like, before he even, like, was familiar with any of our content. And this was back in our early days, too, when mm. we hardly had any content. But <laughs> when he was like, dude, I want to be on the show, and da 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 I want to be like, and you're like, hey, what do you think about this? I'm like, ask him if he's totally cool with all the shit I said of the last episode about, like, kid diddling and <laughs> saying the N-word profusely. Because like, right. if he's cool with that, then obviously it's fine. <laughs> yeah, yeah. All right, so... <clears throat> I'm going to link to a video called the first rainbow about the first rainbow. I'm going to link to a video about the rainbow coalition. And uh, Marcus, I would stop. urge you do it again. Just because when you said, I'm going to fucking link, you're like, I'm going to link. I'm gonna link. Right. <laughs> Got you for three minutes. Thank Sorry. you. Thank you. <laughs> I was angry at myself. Right. I know. Relax, okay. Bro. All right. All right.